Is there a battery in here? There it is, baby. Hold on, let me tune this thing up. Yeah. I don't remember. Yeah, I have to look at it. <laughs> All right, goddamn it. Yeah, baby, yeah. Panda, you're gonna miss it. Let me know what spring is like on Jupiter and Mars. In other words, hold my hand. In other words, oh baby, kiss me. Fill my heart with song. Fill my heart. Let me sing it forevermore. You are all I long for, all I worship and adore. That's a door. In other words, please be true. Oh, in other words, Phil, I love you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. But the audience will come up and say to me, hey, will you play this song? I'm like, I'm sorry, I don't know that song. I'm like, yeah, you do. You played it last time you were here. I'm like, I've never even heard of that song. Uh -huh. they're, they're not connected the way that sober people are connected. So I always tell the band and other bands too. I'm like, hey, you're playing for the staff. You're not playing for the audience. No. Yes, you're playing for the audience, but in a different way. You have to mix it up. You got to change it up. And I don't mean we change our songs every time we play a show. But we definitely add things, songs that we haven't played in a while, just to mix it up, place things differently, do something different. You gotta, you gotta keep it fresh. This is the moment we've all been waiting for. It's time! Presenting the champion of the world! Yo, 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 it's your boy, it's Phil Wham Bam Benamino, and it's another Wham Bam Wednesday, baby. You know the show about ordinary people who have done extraordinary things, and today's no different. We're going rocker today, that's right, we're going music. We got musician, we got, uh, th this guy has done so many cool things, I don't even wanna, I don't even wanna, I'm just gonna surprise you. Because before I even introduce him, I gotta tell you first, please, you gotta go subscribe to the show. The show's free. All we ask is you subscribe to the show, and make sure you share it, you like it, tell everybody about it, because you know what? It's the only way we can get this cool content to you every single week. But today, I got actually a guy who's actually made music his career. That's right. His name is Justin Borgman, and the band Justin is here in the house today. Justin, how are you, baby? Hey, buddy. What's going on, man? Oh, man. I'm going here. I feel like I need to get a guitar, baby. I well, need to get up no, here and play. Well, we got Slash here. Where's Phil? Where's Phil? <laughs> Phil, hold on. Let me call him. Phil, you need to get out here. <laughs> So there we go. I He's back. It. He's back, man. I got to get in character, man. Know, you know, I'm know, really right? excited. Well, you know, uh, well, first of all, you know, tell, tell the viewers a little bit about yourself, man. How did you become a musician? I mean, obviously, music has been your life, and you're one of the guys that I've known for a very long time. I can yeah. call you, call my friend, which is very awesome. Yeah. But you've been playing music for so long and actually making a living doing it, which is really, really hard to do as a musician. Hard, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I don't think you become a musician, it's a calling. Uh, I come from a musical family, so I remember being a kid, I don't remember what age, I would put up handwritten posters, hang them on the wall in the house saying, Justin's performing in the living room tonight at 8 o'clock. And like during holiday dinners, and they'd all go in there and I'd, I'd have a spotlight. Really? I don't remember That's what, cool. Yeah, That's I, don't, <laughs> I don't remember what I performed, but I remember <laughs> doing it. I th it was probably turned on the radio and I used to make fake guitars. So, you know, my mom's a singer. Mm -hmm. uh, she sang with groups. I got this great picture of her in the 60s with a, like a female girl group with a band and stuff like that. Oh, my yeah. dad was a, a band leader. He played all over where I'm from, all over in Ohio, the tri-state area. He was a band leader, multi-instrumentalist. I never knew my dad, but when I found that out, that he was a musician and did all that stuff. I was already like a teenager really? now, doing did, that exact same thing. I was like, blew my mind. So did your dad raise you then or was he gone? No, I, I, was I, it, I never so met my dad. Never divorce met. family? So my gotcha. mom and dad got together. They met at a show. Oh, uh, really? Imagine that, right? <laughs> Imagine that. Yeah. And, uh, and they were together and then he went off to the army because I think uh, whatever was happening at that point in time, Vietnam, I think. Oh, yeah. He went off to Vietnam didn't have a choice. 
Well, I think back he, then. I, I, don't, I don't know if he was. Dra- I don't know okay. much about, it, but I okay. know he won. And they they corresponded back and forth for a while, but then it just kind of faded. Okay, and that was it. So that was it. So not yeah. that. Not so that. I, I never got to know him. But but, but he was but, musically. Yeah, yeah, he was a band leader. Yeah, that's I crazy. Mean, he did he did what I do now, which is so interesting because again, when I found that out, I was already playing multiple instruments. I'd already been in bands before, and I was like, oh, wow, that's crazy. Now, can you play every instrument? What instruments can you play? Uh, if it's a musical instrument, I can make it do something. Yeah, okay. I like if, that. If yeah. it's got strings, I can make, I can make it do something. <laughs> you can make it do something. The only, the, only, the only time I've ever come up against something that I couldn't play was a brass instrument. Yeah. I borrowed somebody's saxophone once Yeah. and thought that I could just muscle my way through it. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't work out. Whole different thing. Yeah, saxophone's a, a, a different, well, a different it's a reed breed. instrument, and there's a trumpet. You have to have a lip for it. You have to know how to. You don't just <laughs> blow into a, a, a trumpet. Right. It's a. It's a. You're doing that thing. Yeah. And then with a with a saxophone, there's a reed, and you got to put your lip a weird. I couldn't even make a sound. Yeah, saxophone's sexy. I'm not gonna lie. If I it's could play an instrument, sexy. I would fucking oh, do yeah. that saxophone. Oh yeah, it's a, it's a cool instrument. <laughs> I don't think I get the lungs for it, but I would. That would be uh, that would be my choice. You, you build it up just like any muscle. Yeah. Now you know. I know you lead though out with your bass, right? Bass guitar is I really do, what yeah. you do when, when yeah. you're singing and stuff and that, out there. That, that, I fell into that. So uh, my uh, I moved to Atlanta in 1990, and pretty much from 90 to about 95, I had nothing but original music. I was part of a band, and we had great opportunities. We opened up for a lot of great people. Ace Fraley from Kiss was a highlight of that. Huge. Yeah, open up for nice. Come on, man. It was amazing. Yeah, I bet it was. So, did you have to paint your face too before? No. Or no? <laughs> and so when I joined that group, I didn't want to play an instrument. I just wanted to really focus on singing because I'd always been a singer, but I really wanted to get my voice to a point where I was a singer. Mm-hmm. And we lost our bass player. Our bass player decided he wanted to do other things, so we were auditioning people. And I'd played bass, mm-hmm. but never took it seriously. Um, and the guys who would come in and audition, I would be the one kind of going, no, 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 you play it like this. No, no, do it like that. Oh, it, it goes this way. And so one day in rehearsal, uh, the guy who was auditioning left and my band looks at me and they go, like, you need to play the bass. Right. And sing. I was like, you be kidding me? Hmm. I was like, dude, that's no, uh, I'm not going to do that. It's not, it's not easy. I mean, to dude, play and sing no at the same time. How hard it is oh, I that. can tell you, man, I tried to learn the bass for a little bit yeah. there, but um, you know, I can't even imagine singing. Very difficult. You know, and, and working a crowd, which you do an awesome yeah. job at. So the band wore me down. <laughs> and at the time, and still to this day, a huge fan of Sting. Yeah. So they would literally just call me on the phone at work. At the time I was a bartender, they'd call me at work. I'd pick up the phone. And they wouldn't say, hey, hi. They would just say, well, Sting plays bass and sings. I'm like, dude, I'm not going to, you know. <laughs> yeah. I, I, it's, it's just really hard. And I knew how hard it was. Right. So... They wore me down. I eventually decided, I, I said, okay, I'll, I'll try it. Uh-huh. At the time, that band played what would be considered kind of prog rock. It was rock and roll, right? but it was a little bit more complex, you know, a little bit more like a jazz fusion, but it was rock and roll. So we had a lot of weird songs. There was a song that we played. It was in 7-8, but what I was singing was in 4-4. Four, four. So one, two, three, four. One, two. Most songs. Thank you for clarifying Most that. Most songs are in 4-4. Four, four. <laughs> okay. Well, the music was in 7-8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Ah. One. So I'm playing. Learning something here. I'm, I'm learning something. So I'm playing 7-8, but I'm singing 4-4. Four, four. It was like my brain was splitting in half. Right. And it took me a really long time to be able to get that one song that my band, that we wrote. We wrote it. Oh, yeah? And so. Do you remember the name of that song? Uh, give me a second because <laughs> we recorded it. Yeah, but, but uh, and it was at the very end of the song. We would do this thing. So I told the I told the guys. I said, if I get this, I will be able to play and sing any song ever written because it was nuts. Two people should have been doing that job, but one person was trying to do it. Mm-hmm. So I eventually got it. I eventually got it. And true to my word, pretty much I've not had any problems since. I. I th- Billy Jean gave me a problem. Yeah, that's the only song. In, in well, that's one. because you're trying to dance almost, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, now your brain's really going that, nuts. Uh, that's the only song in almost almost thirty years of playing uh, professionally that's given me trouble. Yeah, is, is Billy Jean. Yeah. Is did, you do the, did you do the moonwalk while you're doing it though? I, I always ask everybody else to. Yeah. When, when we start that song, yeah. my drummer starts it, and then I come in, <laughs> and the first thing I'm like, I need a, I need to see a moonwalk. I need to see and. 
I'm never disappointed. That's funny. That's funny. That's, <laughs> That's good. Awesome. That's good. Well, you know what? Uh, one of the things that I've I've always always surprised me was how long you've been able to play mm -hmm. and playing out there. You know, there's so many bands. You go out today. You go out to bars and different places. There's a lot of different bands. I, you know, they're all over the place. They travel. I know mm -hmm. you've traveled. You've been all over. You played yeah. from Vegas to Miami oh, yeah. as well as Atlanta, all, all over the country and stuff. The the reality is, there's so many people. What determines one from the other? You know, and what have you found out that's worked for you guys? Because obviously you've had a lot of success doing it. It's and like there's, any, a lot, there's a lot of bands out there that really, you know, don't have this success. It's like any business. You know, why do you, why do you go to a certain barber? Why do you go to a certain, any, anybody who's providing a service, why do you go to that person? It's people. Business is people. So when I'm on stage performing, yeah, I'm, I'm playing a lot of the same songs that the, the bands down the street are playing or the band that played the night before. But each individual in each individual band brings a different energy. One of the things that I tell my band and or have told the guys who play with me over the, the years, I'm like, we're not playing for the audience. And hear this. Okay. We're playing for the staff. Why? Because the staff has to hear this every single night mm. whether it's my band the band that played before us or the band that's playing tomorrow night that's well said i never really thought of it yeah same songs right same thing you better stand out so in order f to keep the staff engaged or at least on our side mix it up like we have a lot of residencies and we always have like mm -hmm. going back to the buckhead days right uh, in the 90s. Oh, got bucket. That's where I saw you first play. Yeah. Oh, Lulu's. Yeah. So, the the, the well, fishbowl. Well, we played every <laughs> single Thursday at Lulu's. Right? Yeah, so yeah. If you're a bartender and you're like, man, I've been, this band's been here for six months. Every Thursday, it's the same songs in mm. the same order. Right. And what happens is at noon during lunchtime, when that bartender gets there for their shift and people come up to the bar, order some food, and somebody says, hey, what's going on later tonight here? That bartender has two choices. They're either going to say, oh, we got this band, Justin. They just play the same stuff every week. Same shit. Or they're going to go, oh, you got to come back. We've got this great band, Justin. They play every week. It's different songs. They do a different thing. They, they bring a different energy. It's huge. And if you don't do that, you're not playing. The audience is going to love whatever you're doing. Right. They're drinking. They're having fun. They're blowing off steam. The people who are working there, they're not drinking. They're not blowing off steam. They're working. Mm -hmm. And so I take great pride in going into a place, performing, and having the staff compliment me. Yeah. I don't, I, it, it's not that I don't care about the audience. I do care about the audience, obviously. Sure. But the audience will come up and say to me, hey, will you play this song? I'm like, I'm sorry, I don't know that song. Like, yeah, you do. You played it last time you were here. I'm like, I've never even heard of that song. Uh, they're they're not connected the way that sober people are connected. So I always tell the band and other bands too. I'm like, hey, you're playing for the staff. You're not playing for the audience. No. Yes, you're playing for the audience, but in a different way. You have to mix it up. You got to change it up. And I don't mean we change our songs every time we play a show, but we definitely add things, songs that we haven't played in a while, just to mix it up place things differently, do something different. You got to, you got to keep it fresh. No, you yeah. know what? That, that makes full sense. Just a fact of thinking about just changing the order. Yeah. You know, well, stop that's a, that's because a, yeah, we don't yeah, have a set list, you know, so that's, so that's, that's huge. Yeah. It's different to, to, you, you know, depending you gotta, on the night. You got to play to the audience in front of you. If we walk into a place and it's, it's 60 and up, I've got a set for that. Mm -hmm. If we go into a place and it's 25 and under, I got a set for that. Right. I got you. You have to be able to, to do that. Right. Right. Your initial question was like, how, how have I been successful? It's because I don't play for me. I play for other people. Right. I play for the staff. The staff. I play for the audience. Yeah. You got to play for the manager too. When the manager comes up to you and says, Hey, you guys are a little loud. Mm. I turn it down. Right. I turn to the band and say, Hey, let's bring it down a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know how many bands don't do that? Right. You know how many times I've walked into a, like a Saturday night, I come in to set up. They, they want as loud as they can until they hear feedback. And well, then no, they, I right? come in to set up for a Saturday night show and the manager come up. Oh my God, thank God you're here. I'm like, why? Well, because the band last night, they wouldn't listen to us. They kept, we kept telling them to turn down, turn down, turn down, and they wouldn't do it because a lot of guys play for themselves because like the audience, they're also blowing off steam mm -hmm. because they've got a nine to five job during the week. And this little thing that they're doing on the weekends, being a rock star, allows them to blow off steam and have fun. I'm not knocking it, 
but you have to do that in a smart way. Like, yes, blow off steam. I know you got your normal job. You're doing your thing. This is for fun. But with that comes a responsibility of listening to the house, listening to the manager. How's the, is the crowd, does the crowd like that song? I know you like that song. Right. <laughs> but does the crowd like the song? You know, All right. it's, it's a whole thing. It's yeah. Whole, whole well, alchemy. You, you know what? One of the things that I've always found amazing with you and I always thought was uh, great is that, you know, you show up, there's, there, there, there's nothing extra. Like you're professional, you're gonna wear a black shirt. You're gonna you're gonna be pretty boy because you're pretty boy anyway. So you got that million dollar <laughs> smile and everything. You know you're gonna perform. You're always gonna sound great because you always sound great and stuff. But you know what? You set up. You don't drink. You don't party while you're there. It's just not. I mean, you you stay right to to, to your script of who yeah. you are as a person and a human being. And I think Jesus. it's probably what what leads you to get some success because people know what they're getting when you show up. Well, people they they drop a word. It's music business people forget about the business part mm, amen um what i do is super fun it's awesome but what i have to do in order to get on the stage you know we play on average three hours a night mm. with a with one break in the middle that three hours is backed by countless hours of me on the phone emailing people driving to a place that's 45 minutes away from where I live just to see what kind of sound system they've got because like, Oh, we got a PA system. And I go there. It's like, it's not what we would, it's not, it wouldn't be up to my standard. Right. So what do you do then? Do you always, do you bring your own? Uh, if a place, if a place doesn't have a proper PA or a PA that's set up in a way that I know that we're going to be successful mm -hmm. because again, it's about, it's about branding. If I come into a place and we sound like garbage, well, what I just, I just hurt my brand. Right. I also hurt the club because people who don't know me or the club just walking in for the first time, they want an experience where they walk in and like, oh, this club sounds terrible. This band sounds terrible. Everything's terrible. Let's get out of here. Mm -hmm. Or if they walk in like, oh, this band sounds really good. This 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 room sounds good. Mm. Let's hang out and get some more drinks. Right. It's all working in conjunction with one another. The wait staff, the bartenders, the band. The experience when you walk it, when you pull into the parking lot, is there a valet there? Are you paying 20 bucks to park? Mm -hmm. Before that person walks in, they're already a little bit disgruntled because they didn't pay 20 bucks to park. And now you're at, you, the drinks are expensive. The band's soliciting for tips. It's like, well, you know, like, it's just, you're getting <laughs> it's beat bedlam. up. It's yeah, bedlam. Beat up. And, yeah. you know, and it's, there's, you got to take all that stuff into, into, into factor. That's why I emphasize music business don't forget the business part now you know what it's great that you have that mindset but i know a lot of people that play in bands yeah and obviously you've been real sad because you guys have been playing together for a long time yeah, but very long but, time. but occasionally you get somebody that's sick and you got to fill in you got yeah is, is it hard to find musicians that have the same that are kind of yoked the same way um yes and no i've been very lucky and i've only found this out through other people working as long as I have. So when you have a brand, mm -hmm. you have a brand, I have a brand, anybody who's a, an entrepreneur putting their, putting themselves, people tend to, if I were to call somebody tomorrow and say, Hey, I need you to, to fill in. They're going to go, Oh, Hey, Justin needs me to fill in. They sort of adhere to your brand. I've never asked anybody in the almost 30 years of doing this to wear black. Yeah. Never done it. Really? They just go, oh, we're going to follow that guy's lead because he's there's something that he's doing that seems to be working. Let's do that. So you don't tell anybody what to wear? Mm -mm. What happens if they show up at something that's not to your liking? You know? Um, Honestly, that's never really happened. So you're fortunate. Well, I think it's because you lead by example. Sure. I think people go, oh, this is working, so I'm, I want to follow suit. Have guys come to shows wearing something kind of weird? Yes. Do I say anything? Only if it happens two or three times. I'm like, huh. And I, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm more passive aggressive about it because I don't want to <laughs> seem like an overbearing band leader guy. Uh -huh. But I'm like, oh, so did you just come from a kid's backyard barbecue? Is that what you're, is that what we're going with tonight? Yeah. You know, just kind of <laughs> right. a little, a little playful shaming a little bit. But, yeah, yeah. But everybody kind of knows the drill. And I think like-minded people tend to be attracted to other like-minded people. Right. That makes sense. No, know? 100%. Uh, everybody in my band, we all have real common uh, 
backgrounds, real common kind of genealogy, if you will. We all kind of grew up listening to the same kind of stuff and fall in line with that kind of thing. So, you know, I grew up in a time where bands were very about the look, like, you know... Uh, you got if, if you look a certain way, long show, hair. Come on, slash. Well if, you, well, if you went to see a show, you saw a show. Yeah, that changed when grunge happened. Grunge happened, and all of a sudden, you could walk in off the street wearing anything and be an arena band. Mm. That, that's never sat well with me. I, mm. I just don't. I don't. It's it's and it's not because it's wrong. It's just that I didn't grow up with that. I, I was in my formative years. The groups that I was seeing were wearing costumes or outfits, and there was a unity whether it was Kiss or the Bee Gees, they all look like they belong mm -hmm. in the, on the same stage. Go watch, a, go watch a Bee Gees concert. They're not wearing Kiss outfits, but they look like they're in the same group. And that's all I wanted for my guys. I don't, I don't care what we wear. It could be we're all white, as long as we look like we're supposed to be together. Right. I don't want this guy looking like you know, he's going to a baseball game. This guy look like he's going to the beach. This guy look like he's going to a goth party. I just don't <laughs> that's want That's another that. band. That's a different that's, band. Yeah, that's a whole, yeah. So I didn't want... The rejects. That's and, it, and honestly, I fell into the whole wearing black thing because it's easy. Mm. When I go to my closet, guess what? I don't have any anxiety about like, what I'm going to wear that So day. you like Fonzie, your closet like Fonzie got all black t-shirts instead show, of white. Fonzie's got all white ones, but you got all black ones. I'm going to show you a picture yeah. <laughs> of my closet. <laughs> We're going to post that. It's nothing but that. black shirts. Yeah, that's funny. That's do funny. I have colored? Very few. <laughs> for special You're not colorblind, are you? No. Oh, okay. No. So that's the best. Well, everybody looks good in black. Yeah. And like I said, it's easy. Yeah, it I, is. You know, I'll be wearing a black t-shirt and a black pants and people, what are you all dressed up Well, for? I'm so glad. See, I followed the, I wore my black wham bam shirt today. And you for, look good, right? <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. That's good as you. But you know, I'm trying. I'm trying. So, you know, being a cover band, Justin. A lot of yeah. people sometimes, you know, they they harass or they they say you know negative things sure. about cover bands. Like as oh, well as they should. You, you know, uh, like I'm I'm in a real band because we play our original music and that's all we want to play. But they're not getting the gigs and they're not getting the uh, you know they're not getting out there in front of people. How, how do you feel about that? And how do you, how, what are your thoughts on it? They're right. They're right. Here and here's why. <laughs> I've got a great picture of my senior prom. I don't say this to boast because I had nothing to do with it. I was on the prom court. I was elected to be on prom court, which would, if I would have Easy, won. pretty boy. I no, know no, you're no. a king. No, okay, no, no, go no, ahead. No, no, say no, no, no. You got selected king. <laughs> you not, I, I promise it's not a flex. <laughs> it was when they, when they made that, that announcement, I was like, what? Because I wasn't popular that way in school. Anyway, I'm going off the, off the rails here. I've got a great picture of, of prom court and we're standing in front of the band that my, my senior class hired and it was a cover band. Mm -hmm. And I remember distinctively thinking, Oh God, these guys like that must be like a living hell to be in a cover band. Cover band was a nasty word mm -hmm. when I was growing up and it was until I was in my mid twenties. Um, every kid wants to, as, as well as they should, when you're young, you should be shooting for the stars. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to be a baseball player, you're not thinking, oh, yeah, I want to be in the minor leagues. Right. Who does that? Right. You want to be your hero. You want to be, true. you want to be, if you're a football player. You want to be with the Yankees, baby. If, I used to, I used to, I used to draw, I used to draw pictures of the building that I was going to own with my company name on it. Mm -hmm. That's what I did as a kid. Was it named Justin too? It's called Empire, Empire Productions is what it was. Oh, I like it. Yeah. Empire Productions. And so, uh, you know, when I was a kid, going back to my senior prom, I just was like, oh, this cover band. And they look like old dudes. I'm like, oh, man, that's like, you know. But when I grew up and got into a situation where my original band, we were doing great, but, you know, we didn't make any money. It's like winning the lottery if you do. I came across, my, my, my band eventually dismantled. They literally called me one day and said, hey, we're, we're done. I was like, ah. Oh. Can't handle it no more. I just, I just didn't want to do not it. Not making any money. Not fun. They didn't want to do it. Yeah. So a guy called me and said, hey, you know, I'm putting putting together a band. Wanted to know if you wanted to play bass and, and sing. He was also a singer. I'd be backing him up. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, if I hook up with this guy, I'll be able to actually make money and do this for a living, of which I my goal, I never wanted to be a rock star, be a star. Yeah. I wanted to be a professional musician. There's a difference. I just wanted to play my instrument and be able to feed myself and live a life like, you know, a plumber. Right. So 
I was like, well, if I do this, I'll be able to, to do that. I'll, I'll be able to be a professional you know what, dude, musician. I, I got to stop you right there because yeah. there's not too many people that I know that mm -hmm. actually play in bands or actually play out. That because first of all, being a musician, you got to have you have some talent, right? You you got to be very talented. It's yeah. not for everybody. Or you got to work you, hard. You, you yeah. got to work hard. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Like you know, playing a guitar, trying to learn that. Yeah. It's freaking hard. It was yeah. very probably the hardest thing I did. You know, mm -hmm. when, when I was trying to do it. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, you got to put in the time. You got to put in the effort, and you got to be all in. Yeah. You're either all in or all or, in. Or, or, or you're not. Yeah. You know, type of thing yeah. when it comes to it. Not everybody has that mentality of hey i'm doing this as a business mm -hmm. and i want to make a, li a living doing it mm -hmm. they go in it as like you said earlier the dream i want to be a rock star like i just i want to be a rock star i want to yeah. play in the arena yeah. you know play madison square garden in front of everybody mm -hmm. you know type type of thing you know yeah. i want to be the, the taylor swift i want to sure, sure. i, I want to be the freaking bon jovi the brett michaels like that's what i want to be Mm -hmm. And the reality of that very small portion actually have that opportunity. Yeah. So, you know, that's all the, gonna be tough. All the all the people I know who have made it to a level that we would consider made it, if you talk to them, they'd be like, Well, I'm still I'm still working on it. But uh, you and I would say, Yeah, they made it. Mm -hmm. Every one of them will tell you how lucky they were. I'm not right. gonna name drop anybody, but I know quite a few. And Every one of them. Like, give us one. Give us one. No, Throw no, 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 no. It's obnoxious. Oh, oh. But they all say, I got really lucky. Yeah. Because if this, if the, if I didn't know this guy and this guy didn't know that guy and da, 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 I would have never had that meeting, which led to this, which led to that. But see, I think that's God's plans, you well, know, in a lot of ways. Like there's, there's that timing, you know what I'm saying? Well, that people are always like, oh, the timing isn't right or the timing isn't yeah. right. Or I got lucky or I didn't get lucky. I, I believe you kind of make your own luck too, because you got to put yourself yeah. in that position. Well, you have to put yourself in the position. You know what I mean? If I want to be a musician, the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to put myself around a, a, some kick-ass musicians. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to find the the best freaking trainers. I'm going to buy the the best teachers, and I want to be around the best well, people. I want to be in their environment. You've been through that, though. of course. Of course. And you know the difficulties. It's like you can you can work hard, you can you can do all the right things, and it still doesn't happen. Yeah. Why is that? Well, because you didn't meet the right person. The timing wasn't right. There's so many factors. It is like winning the lottery. It really is. So with that being said, you know, my original group disbanded. I went and played with this other guy and a whole new world was open to me. I was like, oh, you know, playing cover music is fun. Mm -hmm. I'm getting the same high that I got when I was with my original group. I'm getting it more often because we're playing all the freaking time. Mm -hmm. I mean, back then we were playing five, six nights a week, two shows on Saturday. Oh, wow. We played during the Olympics when it was here in Atlanta. And oh, yeah, we played 90s. 30 days in a row. Wow. Multiple shows a day. I remember I woke up and my hand was like this. Yeah. And I had to peel it open. Wow. Because my hand was just like locked in this grip of, mm -hmm. of my instrument. Right? Absolutely. You're playing in your, in, in your sleep. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I've been told I do this in my sleep. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> um, but with, you know, kind of leading what you were saying is it's once you realize the money that can be made, the opportunities that can be, that, that, that can be had playing cover music, it's kind of awesome. Yeah. It's, it's, it's fun. You're, and I, I never had the ego that told me, oh, well, this isn't rock star stuff. Like it is rock star stuff. It's right. totally rock star. Stuff. <laughs> right. I don't really care about that. I want to make a living playing an, my instrument. Mm -hmm. And it's just, you know, I consider myself, dude, I'm, I'm the same as a plumber. You know, a, an establishment calls me and says, Hey, we need your services today. Right. Cool. I'll be there this time. I go there with my tools Tools are my songs, right? The band, the equipment that I bring, uh, the professionalism that I bring. I knock out the job and I get paid and I leave. Mm -hmm. I have no delusions of grandeur, but I never really did. Even when I was eighteen, I didn't have delusions of grandeur. I thought to myself, well, if being as big as Kiss or Prince or any one of these people who I liked, if that is a result of my actions, cool. I just want to be happy. Mm -hmm. 
And I'm Amen to that. super happy, dude. Yeah. Well, I mean, listen, you're one, like I said earlier, you're one of few that I know that actually made a living doing this. Most people, like you said, they have jobs during the day. Yeah. Now, I know you work during the day, but you work on your own craft. Oh, like, yeah. You work on your own yeah. stuff. Yeah. And you started other companies with your video yeah. and all the other stuff. But but the reality is like I've seen you do shows, solo shows as well. Yeah. You know, yeah. where you're like, hey, you know what? I'm gonna pick up a gig over here oh, yeah. and yeah. I'm gonna do a, you know, just just a solo show on myself, or yeah. I'm just gonna play background music yeah. for, for for a wedding or something if they need. Like people you know, are, you don't turn music away. People are paying me money right. to do something that I do already in my living room. Why would I turn that down? It's mm. crazy. So tell kids out there today that are trying to start a band or in a band, but yeah. they don't know how to get themselves out there. Although they have so many different opportunities with social media, the way it is mm -hmm. today and stuff. Mm -hmm. But like, what would be the best advice that you could tell them to do, you know, in order to try to get gigs and, and, and to develop those relationships that you have over the years? Cause I know you've been doing this 30 years, but yeah. you made a lot of great relationships along the way. Oh yeah. But you know, they need to just come up and, you know, tap you on the door and say, Hey, you know, you want to come play for me. Now, now you, you got to freaking book you two years in advance, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the beauty of that is there is no one way to do any of it. And I, I don't necessarily think there ever really was. But nowadays with social media, wow, it's it's all over the place. My best advice would be, I, well, I'll tell you what. i tell you. I had, a, I had a friend of mine. She called me up one day and said, hey, I've got some really cool opportunities up in Nashville. Would you mind coming and playing guitar behind me? while I go and sing for these meetings. I'm like, yeah, mm -hmm. great, that sounds fun. Never done that before, but I'd be happy to help you out. We, we go up to Nashville, super sweet girl, and she's a very talented singer. And she's got three meetings. One is with a record label, one is with a publishing house, and one is with like a songwriting house, which Nashville, that's, you know. Sure, and that's it's, the way it's to go. All, most of the me meetings are on Music Row. So we go to the record label, and immediately we see this poster of this young girl on the wall, a little blonde girl. She had just come out with a very first record. I believe she only had one single out. Her name was Taylor Swift. Mm -hmm. It was her label. Scott Bruchette, uh, Bruchetta, I think his, his last name is, Scott. So her meeting was with Scott. And so we, they could not have been nicer to us in that meeting. And we're sitting there and... She sings the songs and she's got a great voice. I'm playing guitar. And he says, that's, you know, that's great. You look great. You sound great. And he starts to ask her some questions. He's like, well, so, you know, do you write songs? And she's like, well, you know, I'm kind of getting into that. Do you play any instruments? Well, you know, I, I play a little bit. I'm, I'm learning piano and I, I want to play the guitar. I, I'm, I'm getting into that. And he asks her a couple other questions. And, and eventually he says, all right, so... You know, the music business, you have to be all in. There's there's no putting my foot in it, putting my toe in it. You have That's to. That's true, 100%. Because, because if not, it will eat you alive and chew you up and spit you out. Yeah. And it'll be really harsh. Both mentally and financially. You have to live this. Like, it has to be so far who you are that you, you know. And she took it all very respectfully. And he started giving us an example of this artist that he had signed. And he said, uh, when we signed Taylor Swift, she had like 150 songs already. She played the guitar. She played the piano. We couldn't, we couldn't physically get in her way to stop her doing these things. Like her mom told her, hey, Taylor, why don't you slow down and take a break and take a vacation? And her response to her mom was, take a vacation from my dream? Like, why would I do that? What he was trying to illustrate is the drive that Taylor Swift had at such a young age is what she would be competing with. And if she didn't have that same passion, you're, you're, you're not going to make it. Right. He said that Taylor Swift, we would all be at a, a conference meeting in a, at a big table, marketing meeting. She'd be at the one end of it, and she would have better ideas than people who had been in marketing for 20 years mm. because she lived it. Right. Like she, that's what, she, you know, there was no off time for her. And it, again, and I'm not throwing her under the bus. She had no idea, you know, uh, she had gotten in that situation because someone had heard her voice and said, wow, you're really, really talented. You might want to look into this. It wasn't like something that she was dreaming of. She just was like, oh, I might go down that path. Let me explore that. No fault of her own. 
Meanwhile, I'm biting my lip in these meetings going, it's, I do that. <laughs> I do that. <laughs> of course I couldn't do that. It was her meeting. It wasn't uh-huh. her. But you know, it takes that type of dedication. You know, you asked me earlier, how did I become a musician? Nobody becomes a musician. You either are, or you're not. Now you might have an interest when you're a little kid and Hey mom, can I take piano lessons or whatever? That's an interest. And you develop it. But I, I've always been a musician. There was, there was no denying that. I, I played anything I'd get my hands on. Furniture, cardboard boxes. I mean, I always, I made instruments. I just, you know, always, yeah. always, always. Hey, folks, this is Wham Bam at Wham Bam's podcast. I want to take a moment to thank our major sponsor, Cost Plus Processing, the leader in merchant processing. If you're a business owner and you're accepting credit cards or need to accept credit cards, reach out to Cost Plus Processing at 1-855-391-9190. That's 1-855-391-9190. And find out why they are the future in merchant processing. Now back to the show. That's awesome. That's cool. You know, you, you, you played for in front of some really good, you know, musicians, some, a lot of good stars. What was your funnest uh, person you actually opened up for oh, that, um, that, you had, that you remember offhand? Well, I know you had a lot. I mean, roll off some of them that you, that you well, opened up for. I, we've had some cool experiences. Uh, Bare Naked Ladies was, was really cool. That was back in the 90s when they had just come out in America and started to gain traction. They were all over the radio here in the, in the 90s. And this was right before that. We knew who they were. Oh. Uh, we, we played with those guys, but we played with Cheap Trick. That was kind of cool because they're legends in rock and roll and we really appreciated that. So that was really neat. Um, I've, I've been afforded a lot of opportunities to meet some legends as well, which is very cool. Being in the music business, you kind of brush up against people. Uh, uh, I got to meet um, Robert Plant from Led Zeppelin, um, which was like, it was insane. Oh. It was, it was for, we were uh, playing for VH1, doing these concerts all over the country with VH1. And uh, Robert Plant and Jimmy Page were in town in Florida. I believe it was, maybe Orlando, they were rehearsing for their big comeback tour in the 90s. And uh, Jerry Lee Lewis was playing that festival that we were playing. And so those guys wanted to come over see Jerry, Jerry Lee Lewis. Well, they knew somebody who worked for VH1, so Robert Plant came over. It was all backstage, so it was very authorized. It wasn't out in the public. So he's just walking with his girlfriend or whatever, and, we're, and a crowd starts to form around him as he's mm-hmm. talking to his friend or whatever. Mm-hmm. And we're just all like, this is Robert Plant, dude. Like this is, and looking at him, like that's Robert Plant. It was just, you know, but you know, Ace Frehley, I mentioned that was really cool because I grew up a huge Kiss fan as a little kid. Right. It's pretty amazing yeah. to, to do that. We've, we've opened up for a lot of people. Um, mm. So many. How do you feel about these guys still being out there? Like, uh, you know, this weekend actually was at a show with uh, Lou Graham. Yeah. So, you know, lead singer of Foreigner, 73 years old. Yeah. Unbelievable. This guy mm-hmm. was, uh, you know, on stage. Obviously, he doesn't sound like he did sound. Of course. But, you know, um, and, and I don't think he took any heat from that because the crowd was singing yeah. like they always will. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, you know, when you talk about cover music and those types of things, like you want the crowd to know the music, like to know the songs. Yeah. And, um, you know, with him being 73, just like, number one, people just trying to be alive at 73 right let alone actually performing a concert yeah, yeah. at his age or which is, working or, or working which is which is pretty cool and stuff but i did notice like his um you know actually opening up for him was uh actually aj's braveheart so shout out to them uh, which is a cover band too mm-hmm. you know and you know people want that though they uh, people really enjoyed you know having somebody where music that they know now i know you've created a lot of your own music mm-hmm. have you ever used any of your music or slid them into your your set list and stuff into a situation like that so you could try to get it out there or? so a buddy of mine who went on to to make it as i mentioned before that's how he he would put in one of his original songs in his cover show he was a cover band mm-hmm. and he put in one song and then he put in two songs and then three songs and people started. And what he did, what, how he created, he created an environment where you could only hear those songs at his show. And people would be like, oh, that's a good song. What is that song? Right. And he said, well, that's one of mine. I'm like, oh, that, that's cool. Like, but I can only hear that song if I go see your show kind of thing. Right. It got to a point where he's doing 50-50. He was doing 50% originals, 50% covers. And that's how he kind of did it. And he... I, I commend him for that. It was very cool. Yeah. 
Zach Brown. Hey, Zach I, Brown. I, I, dro- I dropped, it. I dropped, dropped it. the name. There it is. Yeah. And so uh, I, I do that with my acoustic shows. Honestly, because it's just the band doesn't rehearse. My band doesn't rehearse. We've we've never rehearsed. Uh-huh. So when the band learns a new song, I just say, "Hey, learn this song." And when we play for the first time, it's in front of an audience. How weird is that? That doesn't make you a little bit nervous, Mm-mm. especially. I mean, I mean, not you. You've been doing it thirty years, but at first, it never really made you nervous because, to me, if you're not practicing, I mean, come on, that's like showing up at a game and saying, "Okay, well," and that happens too. I guess now I think about it, NFL. If you, if you get traded and you know, boom, you better learn it real quick, and you're going to learn it on the fly. But still, I mean, it's it's something that you you pick up. Now, don't get me wrong. If if you're new to something and you get dropped in that pool, that sink or swim pool, you can get nervous. But where I come from is, is for lack of a better term, I come from a improv- improvisational kind of background. Mm-hmm. So I'm on stage. I have no idea what song's next. And the band leader just starts playing something. Doesn't say the name of it. I don't know what key it's in. I just have to look at his hands. Right. And just figure it out. That's how I started playing cover music. <laughs> right. So you do that for three years. I never rehearsed with that group. We just, he'd start playing a song I'd never heard before. And I just got to jump in, figure it out. Mm. So when you do that for, yeah, yeah, you could call me tomorrow and say, That's hey. why you're a professional, baby. That's why you're professional. But when you when you're going through that, you don't know that that's going to turn you into a professional. It, it turns you into a professional if you keep going. I if if I got a phone call tomorrow and said, "Hey, you've got 24 hours. You're going to sit in with this band, that band, whatever," I would have every confidence in the world that I'd be able to do that, only because of my background and, and the years of of experience in doing. It. You know, you it's I can only. Even though I'm not a sports fan whatsoever, mm-hmm. I equate a lot of metaphors to sports. Sure, you know, and and as you Pe- just did, right? Of course, because it's 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 a, it's a it's very relatable. similar discipline. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, what I do is very physical. It's a very specific narrow skill set that you have. Same thing with sports. If you're a pitcher, and like you said, let's say the pitcher for the Braves gets traded tomorrow, and now is playing for San Diego, so he's got a week to go out to San Diego to to figure out their how they how each player how they you know he's got to learn that a little but different in baseball than it would be football well but he's you but, know but that player but yeah is i understand what you're a level of professionalism that he's going to be able to adapt very quickly right to whatever environment True. and then bring his skill set to that to fit in etc cetera, etc cetera. same thing with me if i call somebody tomorrow and say hey i need a sub for this show i'm going to only call a certain people number of people who i know will be able to fit into what we do Given their experience, they know how we play. They know that I'm a dynamic player. What that means is it's almost like I'm conducting from the stage. Uh, somebody comes up and says, hey, we'd like to hear this song. I'm like, cool. Uh, the drummer doesn't know the song. That's all right. Follow me. Right. Just I'll give you, I'll, I will say, I, I just need 16th notes. on. Give me 16th notes on the hi-hat and four on the floor and let's start. He knows what that means. Now, if I said that to somebody who didn't know what that means, right, that's a trouble. I'm in trouble, right? <laughs> because I hired the wrong guy. Yeah, that would be me. Uh, you would be in trouble. I have no, no but, clue what that means. <laughs> sure, but but if you had 30 years of experience, you'd be like, you'd look at me like, you'd, you you wouldn't even say anything. You just do it, right? And then we'd be off to the races, right? And then the song would be over, and I'd high five you mentally. <laughs> I'd be like, good job, buddy. Yeah, yeah. I'd be like, yeah, that's good. <laughs> Let's see, put, put me on a football field and start calling out plays, and right. I'm like, what? Right. The, Same thing. What? So here's a question for yeah. you. The band's name's Justin. You're Justin. You're the lead singer. Mm-hmm. What happens when you get hurt? What happens, you know, you, 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 your vocals go out? Has it ever happened where you lost your voice? Knock, I know. Is there I'm sorry. Oh, I'll, knock, I'll, knock, I'll knock. I'll knock. But I'm just saying, has that ever happened? Like, have you ever, in 30 years, tell me, there was never a show where you were at a position where you couldn't sing or you mm-hmm. didn't? Or did you always just grind it through? It's, it goes back to professionalism. Uh, Say, what, what does an athlete do? Like uh, he warms up his his, his calf muscles, his, his his throwing arm, whatever his uh, main attribute is, he warms that up, make sure it's protected. <clears throat> um, there's only been one instance in 30 years where my voice decided it didn't want to come to work that day. Yeah. Uh, but that was due to uh, shenanigans on my part. I went out to the West Coast. Uh, I think it was fall. And I got a convertible, as you do, uh-huh. driving, sure. through, driving through the canyons, yeah. and the mountains, whatever. 
top down and it was nighttime and it was a little chilly mm-hmm. and uh, but I was loving it so I kind of got a little sick and as a result of that and eating a bunch of ice cream that summer I started to have some esophageal stuff going on and one show I my voice just it didn't it didn't show up yeah so I was rasping and then luckily again I surrounded myself with really good people my guitar player he sang kind of supplemented what I couldn't do okay that's the only time I've ever lost my voice. Wow, that's fortunate, dude. Well, that's it's, real. it's not fortunate. I, I I make sure to protect it. Well, no, I get that. You but I'm just to, saying, but you've never had that. I mean, J-Lo just canceled her whole freaking tour. Here's why. You know? Because, A, she doesn't sing every day. Yeah. She doesn't sing every weekend. That's true. Someone like a J-Lo, she won't do a tour in years. Mm-hmm. So you have to build that back up. I took off for the holidays one year. Ten days for yeah. Christmas. Went home. Didn't sing a note. Didn't sing in the shower. Didn't sing in the car. Came back, first night show. I'm like, oh boy. I was hitting the notes, Uh but it was really hard for me to hit those notes because I hadn't sung for 10 days. Right. That's only 10 days. Those muscles surrounding the vocal cords, they atrophy just like anything else, dude. If you're not throwing that football, you take a a month off and then you think you're going to go play a game. No, dude, that arm is going to be like, whoa, what are we doing? Right. It's the same thing. Makes so, sense. Makes sense. Uh, again, not to not to flex or anything like that, but I, 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 w- I was taught how to, to take care of this. I, so, I you know, t- tell, tell the viewers that. Tell, you know, some of these singers that are out there, especially the younger ones, how do you take care of yourself? Like, what, what is part of your... Well, I went to you school. You cold plunge? Do you do any of that stuff, too? Oh, I went to school for music. Okay. So, I was always a music major, vocal music major. So, I was taught how to breathe. Breathing is is singing. So your vocal cords don't do anything. There's no, there are muscles around it. There are all these things, oops, muscles around it, but there's your your vocal cords are just these two little things, right? Mm. Airflow is what you need to make that happen. So if you're not breathing from your diaphragm, if you're breathing like this, <gasps> that's not how you breathe. You know, we were taught as kids, uh, I remember our, our choir teacher said, if any of you have little brothers or little sisters or infants in the house, go watch them sleep and watch them breathe. They make their stomach go out. That's how you breathe. Your, your lungs don't have any muscles around, like attached to them. So they don't expand on their own. They have to, the diaphragm has to go out, which creates room for the oxygen to fill your lungs. And then the diaphragm pushes and the oxygen comes out. So getting very complicated. But if you don't know how to do that, you're going to sing from your throat. Oh, you're going to do this kind of thing. And dude, your vocal cord, song one, you're going to be raspy. You're not going to be able to finish the show. Or, or they go from their nose and their nasal. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's that yeah. But uh, if you've got that <clears throat> licked, let's say you, you understand how to breathe and you're singing properly, your vocal cords aren't slamming together. You hear about opera singers or I think probably one of the most famous popular people uh, is Celine Dion. Like mm-hmm. she went through a thing where uh, people found out she didn't speak the day of a show because when a singer speaks, when you and I speak, I'm talking to you right now, mm-hmm. my vocal cords are touching. They're not supposed to touch. Okay. So if I take and I rub your finger like that for mm-hmm. hours, what's going to happen? It's going to, a callus is going to get on. There. Right. Same thing with your vocal cords. If you're talking a lot or if you're screaming, if you lose your, uh, if you lose your voice at a concert or a football game or something, like you're screaming at the top of your lungs the next day, like, oh man, I was at the game last night. Right, right. It's because your vocal cords were smashing together. Not like do it alcohol. Uh, <laughs> alcohol just takes away the pain. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but as a singer, like I can't scream at a concert. I can't do that. Like I immediately feel like, oh, I need to stop. You know, like I can't, if I'm at a parade, I can't go like, yeah. I'm like, oh, I feel it immediately because I'm not breathing properly. Mm. So oh, again, I'm getting all com, com- you know, complex with it. But as a singer, you have to really be careful getting a lot of sleep and drinking a lot of fluids. Mm. Alcohol dries your body out. Alcohol will hit you right here immediately. If you're drinking a lot, not everybody, there's exceptions. There are people who party and right. friends of mine who back drink on the day, stage. They'll drink on get, stage. Yeah. Yeah. Youth, you know, yeah. you, you can get, you can get away with a lot of stuff when you're 25. Yeah. It's when you're 55. Right, that that stuff starts to. Yeah, Lou Graham didn't have any beers in his hand when he was uh, nope, singing. Probably the not. other night. <laughs> I, that, and that, you know, he's a legendary right. singer. My God, you listen to those songs from the '70s and '80s with that guy's voice on it. Ugh. 
Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, let's switch roles a little yeah. bit. Let's talk a little bit about the business side because yeah. you have been able to sustain a business, mm-hmm. like I said, even through COVID, which was, I know, a horrible time. How'd you make out through COVID? I mean, would you, awesome. well, right, but you did something different <laughs> that most people don't do. Tell, uh, tell the viewers a little bit about what you did and how you how you continued to make money. Well, um, first I have to say, before COVID happened, I was fortunate. I was a successful musician. And so I had money in the bank. I had money. Right. So I remember right before COVID happened, I was about to drop $10,000 on just a new computer. Mm-hmm. I didn't do that because COVID happened. And I remember in hindsight thinking to myself, Ooh, I'm glad I didn't buy the computer because you know, right. how long is it going to, you know, when that, when the lockdown here in Georgia happened, it was around this time, March, because mm-hmm. we were about to play our St. Patty's day stuff and that all got canceled. Mm-hmm. So, COVID happened and I just kind of sat back and thought, well, I'm, I'm okay. You know, uh, I'm not worried about it. I took it as a vacation really. Mm -hmm. As most did at first. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I started to see all these other musicians popping up online doing these shows, these at home shows. Mm. And the one thing that struck me, I was like, man, these look terrible. And they sound even worse. It just sounds like somebody put their phone up on a counter and just recorded themselves. Which, which they did most of them. Which some of them right? did. And right. I, I'm not knocking anybody for yeah. that, but I, I'm a bit of a perfectionist in, in a lot of ways. I want things to kind of aesthetically be pleasing to my v, to anybody who's coming to see me play. Mm-hmm. It just is a certain level of professionalism that I like to, to maintain. So I studied everybody, even like like stars. They're videos look like hell i'm like that looks awful and you have the resources not to look awful All right so it was about a month into it that i started to, to accumulate all of the this knowledge that i'm seeing i'm like i don't want to if i'm going to do this i don't want to do it like that i want it to look really good luckily i have a whole room full of video equipment that I, I, I used for all the, the, the work I did with my video production company. So I pulled out my, my cinema camera and set it up in the living room. I, I have a video of me tearing down my whole I've living room. I've seen it. I've seen it. It's pretty cool. Yeah. And I just Fast completely food. put everything up against the walls. I, I made a really cool backdrop and just kind of did a thing. And I probably sussed that out, I tested it, the sound and the video for probably two weeks before I ever went live because I wanted it to be as top-notch as I could make it. Mm-hmm. I had the lighting all set up. I had a huge mixing board that was going to my computer. It, everything sounded good. And I, I'm getting feedback from f- other friends of mine who are online playing music like, oh, yeah, man, you, you know, I made like $300 one night. I'm like, well, that's, that's kind of cool. I, I, I didn't expect anything. I was like, ah, this guy told me he made 300 bucks. I thought, okay, mentally my goal is if I make 300 bucks, then cool. Right. Doing well. So you, I didn't, go, you didn't say yourself, I'm going to make 301. I just go do a little bit better. No, because <laughs> I, I had, well, you know, in hindsight, we look at that now and like, oh, well, of course. But like back then it was like how live music online, it was just kind of. And people like, are going to pay knowing that we're yeah. in a situation where yeah i, I some of these my, people weren't getting paid at work expectations were low yeah and also again not flexing but i i didn't really need the money right i just i i wanted to i did it to connect with the people who, right. who follow me so i got my computer just off 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 the uh, camera and i'm seeing people come on i'm like oh cool i'm like hey and it's like this party it was so interesting people are like oh my god i'm so glad you're doing this this is so fun I'm like, it was fun for me and I, I was, I believe it was a Saturday night and I think I played for an hour, maybe two. I can't remember. Mm. And everybody was on there and I'm taking requests. It was super fun. It was, I did not expect it to be this much fun. Mm. When I, when I stopped, turned everything off, put my guitar down, turned off all my lights, moved out of that room and I look at my phone and I had made like fifteen hundred dollars, yeah. and I'm just like, "What?" Just it like that. It took me twenty four hours to process that. Like, it's almost bringing tears to my eyes because it was like, it wasn't the money. It was like, "Wow, people are supporting what I'm doing." It had nothing to do with like money or it's awesome any of that stuff. I was like, it blew my mind. I was like, it, I felt like this kind of like 
hug from people. I was like, wow, that was, that was like a thing. Yeah. And so from then on, I did every Saturday at the same time. Mm -hmm. And it was just, it was this really cool community of people who were like, you know, I, I would get, uh, during the week in between my shows, people would send me pictures and they'd say, look, this is our family watching you while we're having dinner on our iPad. And I'm like, what is happening right now? <laughs> I, I just didn't realize people uh, liked me that much. Uh -huh. It goes back to my high school thing. I was nominated for prom court. I didn't know people liked me that much. <laughs> I just don't have that kind of ego where I'm like, ooh, look at me, look at me, look at me. Right. A lot of people think I do because of what I do for a living, but that's not people why People that I'm know on, you know you. Well, that's not why I'm on stage. I'm on yeah. stage because I've, I, I've got this obsession with music. Right. It has nothing to do with the fact that you guys are in front of me watching it. You know, you said a key word there, obsession. I yeah. tell people all this time, tell the viewers, no matter what it is in life that you choose, if you're not obsessed with it, yeah. it's not for you. No. I mean, you have to be, like you said, being a musician, yeah. you're obsessed with being yeah. that. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like, if that's not your obsession, yeah. find something else. And that goes with uh, jobs. It goes with people. Yep. Like if you're not super excited to see your best friend or the, the woman or the man that you're into, that might not be for you. Yeah. You and know what? Versa. The surroundings are so key. I tell people, you know, and people don't realize this till they get a little bit older yeah. and they start realizing because they, they look around. I, you know, uh, one of the kids I, I actually kind of mentor a little bit. He was telling me, you know, all of his high school kids mm -hmm. that were buddies of his went off to college and stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, he didn't go to college. Yeah. So he kind of feels lost. He's a little depressed because all of his buddies are gone. And I'm mm -hmm. like, you, you, that was a period of your life. Like mm -hmm. that's just one period at one chapter, right? The next you're going to have so many other friends that you're yeah. going to meet. I mean, some of my best friends I can name on this, this hand. Mm -hmm. You say, if you have friends on, on one hand, it's good. Right. Yeah. Um, are all people I didn't go to high school with. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I met yeah. them along the way, yeah. you know? So it's like, there are other people out there. So you just gotta, but you gotta put yourself in positions to be around those types of people. Yeah. Like, what do you like? Like what, what, you know, what type of people do you like? What are you yeah. looking for? And then go find a place that has those kinds of people for and sure. then go there. You like eating steak. Go to a steakhouse. Yeah. You know what I'm exactly. saying? Like, exactly. and guess what? Those people in there like steak too. Yeah. You know, and, and, and meet a friend that way. Well, you hit upon something, that whole high school, breaking out of that high school orbit, that way of thinking about high school, it's really difficult because as a high school kid, you don't know anything else. And if you have any kind of popularity in high school or you're a favorite this or sports figure or whatever it is, you're like the king of that. And that is your world. And you can't think of anything beyond that as a kid i think we've all gone through that in one way or another i i know that i got swept up in my junior senior year of going to college and taking your sats and all those i i wanted nothing to do with those kind of things but i got swept up in it because that's what everybody's doing that's literally your entire world everybody you know is doing this and why aren't you and it makes you feel like, am I, am I an outsider? Like, why aren't I doing these things as well? And, yeah. Right. Because I, I didn't do any of that stuff. I, I never took the SATs because I was like, what am I? I want to be a, I want to be a musician. Right. That has nothing to do with <laughs> do the SATs. SATs. Yeah. And I fought that. I you fought know. my social circles. I fought my teachers. I fought my family. I was like, that's not the path that I want to go down. Let me do that. Yeah, but you know, and, and you know, I, I struggle obviously my kid too, Rocco, you know, being in school, you know, he says that, Dad, I learned more from you than I can learn in, in school. You know, I don't even know why I go out and, and go do this. Yeah. And I said, and I explained to him because it's teaching you another lesson in life Different that lesson. we all come across sooner or later right you mm -hmm. have to learn how to deal with things that you don't like yeah. you got to you got to understand how to you know change the situation that you're in to make it you know something different to, or change to, yourself or change yourself Exa yeah. exactly you yeah. know so i'm like you know it, yeah maybe you know algebra isn't for you maybe that's not your you know you, the class that you think you're going to use but maybe that's why you should focus on it mm -hmm. because if you can do the things that you hate to do then everything else becomes so much easier yeah you know, type of thing. My daughter went to a very challenging high school, Walton High School here in uh, Marietta, Georgia, Cobb County. And it was brutal. Like she was, she would be doing homework till 11 o'clock at night, sitting at her desk crying. Mm. And I would be the parent saying, hey, how about we take a break, go get some ice cream? She's like, <laughs> no. Because the currency in her school was not like, you you were the on the in crowd, not because of the shoes you had on or the Jordache jeans you had on, going way back to the 80s. Yeah, wow. It was, are you academically high on the upper echelon of, of are you in the ap class right right that's when you were in yeah, the cool I'm, kids class. yeah so i'm taking i'm taking ninth grade and i'm in seventh well i told my know? daughter i said hey listen when you get out of this high school 
the rest of life is going to be so easy. You're going to breeze through college because this is some crazy hard stuff that you're experiencing in high school. College is going to be a breeze. And when you go out into the real world and get a job, you're going to be falling asleep at work because you're used to this load that the real world does not give you. It yeah. doesn't, it doesn't give you that. Like her high school was so hard. And I said, and she's right. Or she came back and said, dad, you're right. Like all these jobs I've had, I, I finished my work and it's only lunchtime. Mm -hmm. I'm like, Hey, you got a, you got a great work ethic and you're, you know, she'll find other things to do. Right. Yeah. And you know what? You use those in somewhere along the lines. You'll use those. Oh, for sure. Even myself went to college, for psychology sure. major, like, Oh, I'm in sales. Yeah. Well, you know, I, yeah. I didn't use that. But you do. But you do. You know what I'm saying? You do. You're reading people. You you're talking to people. Yeah. You do. You, yeah. you know, use the, the, the skills. Yeah. The one thing I wish they did teach in school was how to manage money and, and let these kids learn what to do with it. You've done a great job. Obviously, like I said, making this, most musicians that are playing cover music are typically have a second job. Like they're working full time during a week and oh, yeah. then at nights, Saturday night, Friday night, just trying to gig out, make some extra cash. Most of, them, yeah. most of them, right. You, not that at all. Yeah. Like you're gigging every single night. You're playing, uh, you know, shows, you're traveling, playing places, yeah. you're playing weddings, you're yeah. playing, uh, you know, big corporate events and stuff. Like yeah. you've done, you've been out in Vegas, you're playing the Caesars yeah. Palace yeah. and things yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. So, and you're getting paid very well, you know, what you should. You're getting paid what uh, you, you, you. Not you, at first though. No. You know, and, and just I, like any business you open, you you make this amount of money, and as you your reputation grows and your service gets better, and all the things that you bring to the table become better and better, then you you can ask for more money. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, tell a little bit about how you diversified some of your money, because yeah. obviously you you know you're not just living off of you know the money you have yeah. day to day. You're doing something with it. You well, know? a couple a couple things. Let me go back to you know having one source of income. Um, to me now is scary. Because you don't want to put your eggs in, a, in one basket. Mm -hmm. And I learned that through uh, going through 9-11. 9-11, mm -hmm. uh, it, it took a minute for 9-11 to touch me in here in Georgia. Georgia, we, we do live in a bubble. There are a lot of people who live in Georgia who have a lot of money. Right. And that, draw, that, that drives the economy here. So when, when something happens in, in the country... Uh, sometimes it it either goes right over Georgia. We don't get touched at all because we do have a nice, healthy economy here, or it takes a minute to get here. So when 9-11 happened, it happened in September, obviously, and it took about six-ish, seven months to, to hit my business. But when it hit, it hit hard. I got phone calls from places that would hire us, and they'd say, hey, we just can't have live music anymore. Nobody's coming in. Everybody's afraid to go out. I don't know if you remember, uh, the idea was stay away from places where lots of people were because right, it was gatherings. Target. Yep. Large sure. gatherings. Yep. So people stopped going out to bars. Uh, and the bars that did still want to have live music, they would call me and say, we, we still want to have you, but we got to cut the money in half. It wasn't sustainable anymore to do what I did. And um, I learned that having one source of income, one revenue stream, uh, could stop... Somebody could turn that faucet off, you mm. know? So years later, um, you know, real quick though, do you yeah. ever tell, tell a customer no, that you weren't going to play for them? Do you oh, ever yeah. get, get yeah. but, but yeah. I'm not, not because of financial, yeah. but it was ever a customer where you just didn't like what they did or what they stood for. You had a, that, like, that's a super, and, and they want, super, and they want you. That's a good question. Yeah. Um, I, I do that more now because my brand is much more established now so I'll give you an example. If some place calls me, I will do my due diligence and I'll kind of suss that place out. Is it a, is it a cool? Is it a nice place? Yeah. Because we have people who come to my my shows and they expect a certain level of of service from the establishment. They don't want to walk into a place that has you know uh, sawdust on the floor or right. the bathrooms are trashed and it's you know whatever. You know, right. it's an older crowd that usually comes to my shows. They've got a little bit of money. They expect a certain level of comfort, right? Sure. Uh, so if I think that a place might not deliver that to my customer, I don't want to just do a money grab and say, yes, they're matching what I've asked to pay for. But the problem is we'll play there. There won't be anybody there because people will go, well, we don't like that place. We're not going to go see you there. So now I've just hurt the club. I've hurt my brand. I got some money in my pocket, but that's it's short term money. I like long term money. I mm -hmm. like relationships with with places. 
my longest running relationship is with a place in Buckhead that's still there. Mm -hmm. And it's been 22 ish year, 23 years that we've had a relationship and it's because of the people, because they know that they're going to get a certain thing from me and I right. and vice versa. This, in my opinion, this business is all about relationships. So, yeah, but you know, I think you said relationships is obviously very important, but I think you said too, what you do by changing up, your set list by changing up yeah, some of the music yeah. it's big you know i went and saw kevin kevin hart i've seen, seen him in vegas yeah he was here just in atlanta not too long ago mm -hmm. it was a whole different new material yeah nobody yeah. wants to hear the same stuff yeah and yeah. you do you do that so you know well, people don't realize that you see justin uh, it's gonna be they don't know what they're getting well also too with the internet if you go see a kevin hart right well you see him live then you watch the hbo special and then you see on social media you don't you don't want to see the same jokes uh, right. As you you went and saw him live, then you now you're seeing the special. Well, you wanted to be slightly different, and it's hard for that comedian to do that. I've I've right. I've listened to podcasts where comedians talk about that. Yep. They're like, man, we live in a in a in a day and age now where I've got people filming me in the audience, mm -hmm. which they don't like that because now well, the person, Kevin Hart, they take your phone, they well, actually put it in a bag, lock well, do you it know up. Why? Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you exactly why because yeah. I, I researched that and yeah. I wanted to know. Yeah. I actually got uh, it was very fortunate, but I got a really good conversation in Las Vegas uh -huh. when Kevin Hart was there uh -huh. with one of his one of his managers mm -hmm. and stuff. Mm -hmm. And the reason what he told me, so this is your yeah, third yeah, part, yeah. what he told me was the fact that it was it's embarrassing for the comedian. Most people want to be they're sitting there on their phones mm -hmm. the whole time, mm -hmm. whether that whether I'm texting my kid or texting sure. you sure. or I'm checking social media and stuff. Mm -hmm. So they feel like you're not engaged yeah. where then 100%. you're going to miss some of the funnier pieces or yeah. some of the material that they've actually took the time to yeah. develop to to get your attention to, to show you. you're paying to be entertained. Get rid of the phone. Yeah. So focus on the person that's actually, mm -hmm. you know, doing the entertainment and enjoy yourself. So yeah. he took this away for that reason. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like another aspect to it. Yeah. Uh, so you're in Atlanta, you're seeing Kevin Hart, you're filming it. Well, you're going to go back and share it on your social media. It's like, oh, we just saw Kevin Hart. Then that person ain't buying a ticket. No. Well, what happens is then your cousin who lives in Baltimore sees that clip, sees the joke. When Kevin Hart gets there, well, the joke doesn't land because the guy already heard the joke from your social media. Yeah. So you're giving away Kevin Hart's show before it gets to the next city. And like, they, they don't want to do that. They're like, hey, I worked really hard on this routine and you're now spoiling it for literally the all the other shows. Uh, Kevin Hart does the first five shows. Uh, he, he hits Atlanta, he hits Greenville, he hits Nashville. He, uh, well, the whole West Coast, before he even gets out there, has seen most of his show because social media. Because yeah. people are filming it, putting it on YouTube. He goes out to the West Coast. Well, he's just lost 50% of his laughs because people already heard that joke. That's that's rough. It, it is. Very it is. different from what Lucky I do. for him, it's all about his delivery. Well, of course. <laughs> that's because uh, he, yeah, he just, yeah. you know what, his delivery, yeah. it, it, you don't have any problem getting a laugh. But, well, yeah, there are people where... But you're just, right. I could see how that would yeah. totally make well, that, sense. And that's kind of what you heard. I've heard yeah. that too. But yeah. I've also heard the addition where like some comedians are like, well, you're giving away my jokes. Yeah. I worked really hard on this for a couple of years. And now that... You know, before social media, you had to go see the show or you didn't hear the joke right. until it came out on the HBO special. How do you feel about people filming you when you're out in public? I love it. You totally, know, totally different. You know, you get problem with, you know, like, oh man, that phone sounds like shit. They had a, no. they had a uh, you know, it iPhone two, like and sometimes it sounds like crap and it makes you feel like you sound like crap, but it's really not you. It's the phone. It's a video. Uh, it's, 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 it's an evil that I have no control over. And I look at it as a positive. The fact that somebody wants to take my picture and film me, that's huge. Yeah. The fact that you want to do that, thank you. Right. I don't, good. It, it, that's, it's good. It's a good way to look at well, it. I would, more people yeah. need to look like that. Well, like I said, I can't control it, number one. Number two, embrace it. It's right. like a, every video somebody takes of me, I'm like, oh, that sounds awful. Right. For some reason, there's a, I don't know what it is, but most bands, when, when you're filming them, the singer sounds off slightly i don't know what it is i don't know what's well, a lot of has to do with sound has to do with acoustic yeah. if it's where it's I, bouncing I, 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 you got people screaming yeah. they're dancing i see videos of know? myself i'm like god do i i know i don't sound like that but <laughs> but it is what it is but i i i am humbled by the fact that anybody wants to videotape me and i'm like hey that's awesome I, when i was 13 i would have given my left arm to have somebody want to film me singing a song so I, i'm still very closely 
uh, connected to that 13 year old kid. Well, let me ask you this, because I know I've seen this red hand. You get a lot of women that want to come at you and jump mm -hmm. on stage mm -hmm. and grab mm -hmm. a kiss here, pinch in the <laughs> ass. Huh? I've seen that a couple of times. Sure. How do you feel about those things? Talk about some of the crazy things that actually have happened out there. I mean, you know, it's funny because, yes, you stay professional at all times. But what are some of the craziest things that you've seen be being out there? Because you've seen a lot. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Here's the thing. And this is honest, me being yeah. honest with you. Yeah. Women and men are different. When a man is ogling a woman or whatever, he wants to follow through, right? Yeah. He wants to follow That's through. That's right. Of course. Every day, all day. All, all the time, right. Women, on the other hand, that's not necessarily their end game. So a lot of women will flirt and they'll they'll come right up to the fence but they won't jump over the fence. Ah. So people think I live this lifestyle of like just chicks left and right and yada, yada, yada. You could, you could come on pretty boy. You I, know, you could, I could, if I, if I pursued, if I had a different set of standards, Does that makes sense. Yeah. Because most of the women who, Oh, I, don't, I shouldn't say this. No, say uh, it. <laughs> it's the real thing. Well, it's true. Okay. So, uh, most of the women who flirt with me, a lot of them want the attention. A lot of them just want to be seen in public That's around it. their girlfriends, having a good time, let me, let me, or let me, they're let, with some friend guys. Just, they well, want to make them a little well, jealous. Let me say this. It happens at, at the end of the show. When the lights come up, none of those women are there anymore. Yeah. They're gone. <laughs> Let's flip that. If I were a woman end of the night, there'd be a line of dudes waiting for me to get off that stage. Women are really different. They're not as aggressive as guys are and their end game, you know, we're simple. Mm -hmm. We there's, we, we, there's a point A, point B women are not simple that way. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've discovered that. Like I take all that stuff in stride. If I'm on stage, I'm getting female attention. I know it doesn't mean anything. I don't, I don't take that and bank it and, th and think, Oh, my self worth is tied up in that. Or, Oh, because these women are into me, of which they're really not. They're into the environment, the situation, and I'm a you know I'm a relatively handsome guy. I, I take that into consideration. But at the end of the yeah, night, all right, yeah, all right. At the end of the night, when the lights come on, those women are gone. Yeah, because that's not that 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 wasn't their end game. And honestly, if there is a couple left over and the lights are on, my little red flag goes up. I'm like, okay, well, what's what's wrong with them? Like, and how many other band dudes have they done this with or? That makes sense, and mm -hmm. that's not be, that's not me being a hypocrite. It's just me being of a certain age and a certain mindset, and who have well, it's I, your standards. Well, it's, it's your moral compass is what you have. Twenty-five, twenty-five-year-old Justin and this Justin, I'm just saying, they're right. different. Like twenty-five-year-old Justin didn't know any better and said, "Oh, hey, right, I'll pick that up." Sure. Justin now is like, mm, "I've done that," and there's there's always a consequence. So. <laughs> Hey folks, this is Wham Bam at Wham Bam's podcast. I just wanted to let you know that we've launched our website and merchandise is now available to you. That's right. We have hats. We have t-shirts. We have hoodies. The hoodies have been going off the shelf already. The stay positive hoodies. That's right. Stay positive, folks, and keep testing negative. As you know, go to our website at www.whambamspodcast.com. That's www.whambamspodcast.com. Now back to our show. So, you know what, talk about that piece of being a musician yeah. and playing out because a lot of people that are married or a lot of people that have a boyfriend mm -hmm. or girlfriend, depending mm -hmm. on what, whether, you know, whether you're female or male, mm -hmm. um, being in a band, you have to, it's going to be nights and weekends. Yeah. It's going to be, yeah. it's going to be travel. Sometimes it's going to be out of state. Sometimes like yeah. Yeah. you're going to have to share a hotel room with somebody, mm -hmm. you know, if the money's not that as well as you want it to be like, mm -hmm. um, how has that affected, you know, personal relationships that you had or has it? And, and what do you do about it? Just something kind of goes with it. Well, I can only speak from two vantage points, my own, and then what I've discussed with women who I've dated. Um, every woman who I've dated, they always go into the relationship going like, ooh, I don't know how this is going to work. This guy, he's surrounded by women. He's getting attention. He's yeah, the girls are screaming around. at you every night. Yeah. And they learn real quick that what it really is. You know, it's there's a lot of smoke and mirrors that accompany this business, number one. Um the nights, I have so much time off now. Like, you know, back when you met me, mm -hmm. we were working six nights a week, just constantly, just, you know, but we were also in our twenties, you know, I mean, it was right. like, you know, I could, I could, I could spring back and blah, you know, now 
I still work a lot, but I work smarter. I work less and the money's more. I'm able to pay my guys more. So, you know, I've like this week, I don't, I, I, I've had like the last seven days off. Hmm. Now I say off, it just means I haven't been on stage. Sure. I work every day. Right. Like I sit down at my desk and I'm working, got huge list of, of stuff I need to do. Um, phone calls, going places to see, I'm, I'm doing, you know, doing a po- doing your, your pocket. Yeah. This is, this is work. Yeah, that's right. I was a hundred percent. I love yeah. it. Yeah. Hanging out with my buddy. Yeah. But you know, that's the perk. I'm, uh, it is a perk, <laughs> but, uh, relationships, every woman within a couple months, they realize, Oh, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. This is a lot better. I thought this was going to be, you know, I'm not a guy I've, I've never drunk. So, uh, when I, when I finish a show, I'm home as, as soon as I, and they're like, Oh yeah, it, they, you learn, I don't, I don't ever have to give a speech to somebody I've dated. Hmm. They just see my actions. It speaks way louder than anything I could tell them. And pretty soon they realize, oh, this is a professional. This this dude is, he he's coming home. He's not. See, I wanted people to hear that because yeah. so many people mysteriously automatically think you're a musician. Oh, yeah. That, you know, after the show, you're going to be out drinking and oh, partying. Yeah. You're going to celebrate. Yeah. And it's going to be a three, four in the morning. And oh, God yeah. knows what's happening mm-hmm. behind closed doors. Yeah. And it's just going to be a shit show. Not yeah. everybody's like, like, that does happen. Oh, yeah. But not everybody does that. Yeah. It's a choice. Yeah. And that's well, kind of where I'm. I've oh, literally yeah. had met a woman on a show. And right out of her mouth, she says, oh, well, I don't even know how I met, but she, you know, oh, I'm Justin. Oh, I'm this person. She says, oh, well, you, you must be an alcoholic because you're a musician. I'm like, wow. <laughs> Boom. Labeled. Projecting much? <laughs> right. Said, no, you should. Did you say recovering one? You mean, you, you mean recovering? <laughs> oh, well, well, that, well, that, well, see, I get that when I tell people. Yeah, because you don't drink, drink and they think I'm you're like, recovering. Oh, well, are you, are, are you, I'm like, no, I just don't like alcohol. <laughs> Uh, you know, when I was a teenager, when we hung out with our, with our boys and go out, and, uh, we'd go to a party. We'd go to Seven Eleven, have some eighteen year old. Uh, I was uh-huh. drinking age at the time. Yeah. Buy us a little mad dog, a little no, mad dog, empty like six pack of beer. Oh, you know, okay. Each well, of us get a six pack. Or whatever. What kind? What kind? What kind? Uh, well, I'm from Cincinnati, so we had local brands. Okay. So uh, Hudipol was the local brand. So ah. Hudy Delight, Hudy Gold. Gotcha. That's why. <laughs> so, but I hated the taste of alcohol, so I would chug all of my beers and pinch my nose and just chug it before we even got to where we were going to the party. I, I wanted to have the experience of, of being stupid and drunk with my friends, but I, <laughs> dude, the alcohol just tasted awful. Yeah. And I, you know, before I was playing music professionally, I was a bartender. Yeah. I bartended for years and never took a drink as a, the only way I even the fruity ones, even the salt, sal- you know, I got the salsers now dude, and stuff, dude, everything, you know, the happy taste dads, alcohol you know, in like, like, a certain like you know how they they cook certain meals and like oh this is a wine sauce no it tastes yeah. awful <laughs> i don't know if i'm allergic to it like right. it might be hereditary because like like half of my family doesn't drink like my mom doesn't drink mm-hmm. like my grandparents never drunk anything so i don't know if it's like i taste alcohol and it just tastes awful to me doesn't matter what it is well you're lucky you're, I, you're I, tried. De- I mean no you're lucky because i mean obviously uh, you know i haven't drank since just january 1st just mm-hmm. doing this uh you know 10x with the health yeah. with gary gary breck and stuff Good for you. and i'm on this journey and i'll tell you what i ain't ever felt better yeah but you don't realize you have a drink and all of a sudden it's like poison just hit your body you feel yeah. like crap yeah. you know immediately have so you sleep better yeah. Oh, yeah. Hundred percent. Yeah, that's what I hear yeah, from yeah, everybody yeah. who's For sure. For I sure. just, it, again, it's not anything pious or like I'm better than somebody. I literally do this, and I'm like, that tastes like garbage. And I tell people, think of your least favorite food that you would just never put in your mouth. Right. That's what alcohol is like to me. Doesn't matter what it is. Doesn't matter if it's fruity. Doesn't matter if it's the beer. Or just, it just doesn't taste good to me. I promise you, if I like the taste of it, I probably would have a problem. Yeah. That's funny. <laughs> that's funny. So any cool stories that are out there, you know, any bar fights that were going on, you're in the middle of stage, what, 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 what do you do? You stop playing, you call for, like, what happens? Okay, back in the day, yes, uh, when we were playing more college stuff, when we were all younger, my audience has changed, you know, my audience Well, it's because we're all getting older, well, yeah, and the my, audience sticking with yeah, you. Yeah, my audience has grown <laughs> with me, so you're not going to get a lot of 40 and up having big fights. Yeah. Back in the day when we were in our 20s, my God, yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the jobs I had before I started playing professionally was I was a concert security. 
Mm. So I was taught all these really cool things. <laughs> so uh, we were mandated to always carry a flashlight with us when we were doing. Look, you still have it. I love it. Concert security. Yeah. So I've been. I've had. It, it, there's a name for it now. Everyday carry. Have you uh, heard of everyday carry? Yeah. 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 So there wasn't a name back then when I started. So uh, we we were uh, taught Aikido when we were doing concert security, mm -hmm. and so. This is not a mag light, but a mag light is a little bit thinner and skinnier. It's got like a bulbous uh, front. We were taught all these locks and moves with this. I could put uh, put this around your wrist and I could control your whole body. So um, I shortly started performing live uh, full time. Uh, so I've never not had a flashlight because I work on dark stages. Mm -hmm. So one of the concert security things uh, that taught me a lot about being physical with people. Yeah. So back when I was in my 20s and there would be a fight broken, depending on what was going on, uh, if there were no security around, I would jump out in the audience and I didn't even think about it. Because in the audience, you've got big dudes, right? They're going to take care of themselves. They're going to be fine. Yeah. These little these little girls, these little 20-something girls getting high elbows in the face and stuff like that, those are the ones who always got hurt. It, you know, Yeah, guys might get a bloody nose or something, but six-foot-what-something dude, he's going to be fine. Uh -huh. It's little 5'2 girls who get pummeled. So I would jump in and grapple guys and drag them out sometimes. Again, I'm not boasting. That's just what sure. I did. Sure. I'm a big dude. I'm 6'2". Yeah. Yeah. And if I got boots on, I'm 6'4". Right. And I, I, you know, I know how to take somebody... Right. someplace if I need to. So that happened a lot um, back in the day. Lulu's. Oh, man, I, I drug dudes out of there yeah. a lot, actually. So while you're playing, do you, you like you just mainly stop, put the oh, guitar yeah, down? Drop, I, I've, I've dropped my bass in the middle of the song to take somebody out. Yeah, yeah that was it. It's on. And again, it's not boasting. It's just like I'm, I'm seeing a problem. Like, whoa. And there's no security. Security's not noticing it. Yeah. And and I'll even go so far as to do one of these to, Shine a light to out. get their attention. Now I got to ask you, do, do you bring that light with you everywhere now? Or uh, were you scared today coming to Wham Bam's podcast oh, no, that you no, no, thought no, no, you no, might no. need this, the security? This, <laughs> this is with me 24 seven. Okay. All right. I've got a little knife and I got a little, <laughs> and people are like, why do you carry a knife? Oh, you'd always need something. And I'm like, are yeah. you kidding me? Have you never like had to open a package, open an envelope? It's got yeah. a little screwdriver. I use this yeah. every day for yeah. something. Right. And the flashlight, people make fun of me. And then, we're out someplace and it's dark, even like little crappy cell phone light. No, mm. uh -uh. and they're always like, Oh, can I use your light? I'm like, Oh, you mean the, the light that you made fun of? <laughs> you, you, I'm sorry. You want to use that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Here you go. Just remember that next time. <laughs> so listen, obviously your life's changed. You're doing a lot of great new things. Where do you, where's Justin in 10 years from now, 20 years from now? That's a good question. Yeah. Um, so, it is, we are in March right now, and I just had a birthday in February. Cong uh, congratulations, another year. 54 years old, baby. Another, 54. Look, 54. Look 34, man. Good for you. So with that said, I think about where's where's 64-year-old Justin? Yeah. Who is that guy? Well, first of all, you got St. Patty's Day coming up, and I know you're going to be jamming there. Where, oh, where yeah. are you playing this year in St. Patrick's Day? Uh, we are back at our stomping ground, Buckhead. Yeah. We're thanks. playing Fido, Fido yeah. Irish Pub in all Buckhead. Right. Uh, we've been playing there since 99 yeah. or 98. Gotcha. So yeah, that's, yeah. that's the, one of the long relationships I was telling you. Yeah, about. That's a uh, but you know, 64 year old Justin, I have, you know, I, I, you know, you can plan as much as you want to. Hey, 73 year old Lou Graham was still you, singing. You I'm just saying, you know, well, I've got, I've got a loose plan. You know, I, I have diversified. You mentioned, uh, yeah. diversification. Uh, you know, when my daughter went off to college, I all of a sudden had a bunch of free time. And so a buddy of mine who was in film production, he knew that I came from that as a kid. And he goes, hey, man, why don't we do something? But I've got a warehouse full of equipment, video gear. And he goes, my company really only does stuff in the beginning of the month and the end of the month. So I've got like in the middle of the month, let's do something. So we developed a, a TV show. And we filmed it and financed it, and it, it it didn't turn into anything, but it turned into something else. Yeah, he got busy with his production company, and I was like, "Well, I don't want to stop doing this," so I kind of formed my own, and it's been pretty successful in a really short amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, I've got different uh, you shoot some documentaries and stuff. Different yeah, things. so I just I just wrapped editing a documentary that I shot and produced. Um, with a partner of mine up in Nashville and uh, 
that was a four year process. I mean, it, it took me, I think we interviewed about 50 people and I had, I don't know how many hours of footage. It took me a year just to go through the footage that I shot, mm -hmm. just to catalog everything, all these interviews. That's, that's not even the B roll. It's just the, all the, all the inter the headshots, the, the talking heads. Um, but, uh, the documentaries finished, uh, when I say finished, it means just the first draft. Now we're, now we're going to go get nitpicky. I've got an animator who's going to be animating, uh, sort of like the, some of the things that we don't have footage of because this story happened before there were such a thing as cell phones with phones on it. Mm. So a lot of the stuff is not documented. We've got a lot of pictures, but we, so with that being said, uh, production, is, it's great. Uh, I do, I, I direct things. Uh, I edit, um, I get hired a lot for sporting events, yeah. which is so weird. Cause I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> uh, but you're in charge of what? The music? No, I'm, I'm film. I'm, I'm a camera operator. Oh, okay, good. I literally have either a camera on my shoulder or, yeah. or a tripod or I did, uh, ESPN hires me a lot. So yeah. when, uh, the, when the Super Bowl was here, I was embedded with the Patriots. Yeah. So I was at their hotel. So I shot for, uh, ESPN and, uh -huh. uh, they had a producer on hand and they had, uh, they had their on air talent and I was just the camera operator. I had to handle all the lighting, all the cameras and we live streamed all day long. I was there for 12 hours a day. Mm. And then when the Super Bowl, the actual game, cause those guys are here for a week before the actual game happens. Right. Right. So we were, we were, sh I was shooting, I was the sole operator. And then when the actual game, uh, took place, it was awesome. Like, you know, at the end of the game and everybody on the field, like I'm literally on the field, I've got my camera, I got my sound guy behind me and we're interviewing Tom Brady. Mm -hmm. Cause my, my, my guy was like a senior ESPN guy and he got all the prime interviews. So it was, it was, yeah, it was pretty amazing. Yeah. So those things you can continue to do, obviously yeah. develop your own company yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. shooting up and stuff. Are you, uh, do, do you do any, you know, film, like, are you creating any new movies out there at all for anybody or are you um, writing anything? Cause then you write a lot of stuff too. Yeah. I, Along with your songs, you know, I, I got to admit, cause I've heard a lot of your originals. Yeah. They're yeah. freaking good. Thanks. Why Thank don't you. you put them out more often? <sighs> because it's just like so much, there's only so many hours in a day. <laughs> I mean, honestly, Phil, it's, it's one of those things where it's unconscious. I only gravitate toward things that are going to make me money. Yeah. When those things are satisfied and satiated and I can't take that anymore, then I go to projects that don't make me any money. Fair enough. Which would be a pet project, which would be a passion project. And don't get me wrong, I, I still write songs. I've got so many songs on my phone Yeah. because that's, that's something that I don't make that choice. It just comes out kind of a thing. But... It doesn't make me any money, so I don't try. I try not to spend too much time on that, dude. I've got so much stuff lined up. I, I have a, a, an amazing client, video client of mine. I've shot, I've shot their their stuff, and I've edited their stuff. They just put something in my lap that is so huge. I don't, I don't even know how to build them. I'm like, they sent me this whole thing, like, hey, this is what we need you for. I'm like, wow, this is huge. I need to call them and say, you realize how much money right. I'm gonna have to charge you for this. It's like 12 hour days. Like right. they want me there from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. one day. I'm like, dude, like four days now, I think it's like 30, and they don't care. 32. They don't. Uh, well, see, I, I mean, I, <laughs> I don't know. I'm like, I got to have the conversation with them. They're like, hey, you realize how much this is going to cost you, right? Because you've never spent this much money with me before. Right. So with that said, yeah, it's, I write songs still. I do those things, but there's more, I, I put them to the side because they don't make me money. And I don't mean to sound like some kind of money gr grubbing person, but money kind of makes the world go round. Absolutely. You got to have it. I you got to have it to be gotta happy. Got to have it to live. You know, the generation that my daughter is a part of, I don't put this on her anymore. Cause I don't think she thinks this way anymore, but I, she did. But a lot of the kids think that if you have money, you, you, you are somehow a bad guy. You're evil. And that's not true. And I, I, I tell young people, like, with all the things that you want to do, if you want to help somebody, you can't help anybody unless you've already helped yourself. This is now a common thing, but I'm going to claim it. It's mine. Mm -hmm. I thought of this first. Okay, go ahead. I've had this for 25 years, at least. I, I use the analogy. When you're on a plane and they're going through the safety things and they say, hey, when these things drop, the air things drop, put it on your Let's face see. first and then do it on your child. And I remember like thinking like, that's how life is. It's not selfish to take care of yourself first. 
Because if you're not able to take care of yourself, you can't take care of anybody else. That goes for parenting. That goes for your business. Now, it's easy to step over a line and become selfish and become, uh, lack of a better term, toxic, if you will, and, and take advantage of that self-care, if you will, or, or, or take more than you need kind of a thing. It's easy to step over the line. But, you know, I, tell, I used to tell my daughter when she was younger, I was like, well, all the things that you want to do as far as philanthropy or helping anybody goes, it's not going to be a lot easier if, A, your needs are met, you don't have to worry about bills or worry about where your food's coming from, and you have a little extra. If you're worried about how you're going to pay your rent and how you're going to buy groceries, how are you going to have the mental, emotional, and fiscal ability to help anybody else you can't do that mm -hmm. if if you wanted to have a foundation and you had an extra hundred grand laying around you could drop that off in a foundation and help hundreds of people you can't do that if you're poor right now are there people out there with a bunch of money who are not super great people absolutely are there broke people who are horrible people there sure are it has nothing to do with the money. No, but you know what? Money is, is uh, I think it is misconstrued in many, many ways because the reality is, you know, like you said, you need money. You know, they always say the, the phrase money doesn't buy you happiness. Well, I'll tell you what, not having money buys you. Yeah. Unhappiness. Yeah. I don't does. care who the fuck you are. It does. You know what I'm saying? That's a reality. It does. Like it if does. you're, I've seen more people fight over money mm -hmm. and, and I was a victim too. You know, growing up, we didn't have nothing. I didn't yeah. have water growing up. It wasn't that my parents were, were, were bad parents. My parents were great parents. They went mm -hmm. to work. They worked their ass off. Yeah. Yeah. But guess what? At the end of the week, there's only so much money to go around, yeah. you know, and you got to start paying the bills and you got kids and guess what? Little Philly needs, you know, new shoes, you know, mm -hmm. or the dentist, you know, yeah. he's got to get his dentist, yeah. you know, done. And, you know, sister Pamela's, you know, got a, got a music class and stuff that she wants to be in and stuff. So, I mean, like different things had to happen. Mm -hmm. So you're always picking and choosing what you're going to pay, what you're not going to pay. And, yeah. and the fight begins. Yeah. That happens every in every household in america yeah you know what i'm saying yeah. but you just don't see it you don't realize it mm -hmm. you know people we talk about the brands how people you know they want to wear the brands the essential brands yeah. Uh, yeah. the louis vuitton brand yeah. and stuff yeah but yet you go into the home and you see how they really live mm -hmm. and they're complaining about x y and z mm -hmm. but yet they they're wearing the essential sweatshirt yeah you know yeah. type yeah. type of thing like yeah. what makes you think it's okay to wear that you can put the money into that mm -hmm. but you're complaining about utility bill yeah or your food bill, yeah. or so-and-so spent too much money on gas mm -hmm. while they were out working. Like, I mean, you got to pick and choose your battles, man. I agree. I agree. You know, yeah. so it's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. Well, you know, you have, I have watched a number of the podcasts I've watched. Well, thank you. And uh, one thing that is lacking from the podcast is turning the camera back around on you. Yeah. I remember thinking, well, you know, he is interviewing just the whole topic of your of your podcast is a reflection of who you are. So you need to start and I might be the one to sit here and do it. Like yeah, so you're, <laughs> you know, where where where's your background? Where's your where's your drive come yeah. from? Where do you you know, I know I know it. I know your background. I know where you come I know yeah. your I know you know, love your mom. Yeah. And I still can't believe your dad's not here because he seemed like he was your brother. Seven, seven years today. Well he, he never looked like he was even your dad. Yeah. I'd be like, Who is that your brother in the corner? Like you know? So <laughs> He's you know, laughing up there now. Well yeah. he you know, and I, looking at those great old pictures of, of your parents, like yeah. your dad had that you know that um that definitely like that east coast pompadour you know like I, he i loved his look but like for like you where does your where does your drive come from well that's an easy one my drive came from my parents i mean mm -hmm. my parents taught me how to work i mm -hmm. mean mm -hmm. waking up in the morning at 3 a.m to go pick corn before school corn and, yeah corn that's right corn you lived on a farm oh no i didn't live on a farm but we drove to a farm so i could earn some money wow. by picking corn uh 3 a.m in the morning i had to get up there because we had to be at the farm by four mm -hmm. so we could pick corn i picked corn from four to seven wow. and then boom head to school to my school. mother would drop me off at of school and stuff so go to school after school she picked me up and we'd go to the strawberry fields and i'd be picking now, strawberries money, and stuff so that you could have money or that money to help the it was family? it was both it was okay. both it was for you know mom and dad never took my money don't don't get me wrong yeah, yeah, yeah. but i always wanted to help that's just the way i was i was a kid that wow. you know i wanted to do something special for my parents because you know i watched how hard they they, they worked and, and they could you know they could tell my mom we, we, you know could, could tell you and stuff i mean I, I remember it was a big deal uh one christmas you know i saved up a couple hundred dollars and got them a weekend uh, a night at the marriott wow. you know so they could act like they 
they went on vacation and, you know, it was a big thing. I was young. I was maybe 10, 11 years old, uh, you know, and, and the fact that, you know, I how do they feel? About up, oh man, they grew in tears, absolute oh, wow. tears and stuff. Um, you could, t- could tell you that story, but uh, you know, a lot of that was, you know, uh, you know, one of the things I learned, you know, being on the farms and stuff was you didn't get paid by the hour. Okay. Nobody, you, you, you weren't getting paid for a certain time. You got paid for what you earned. And that's the one thing that stuck with me. And when I found that, wow, it was like, hey, you're not getting paid 15 bucks an hour, seven bucks an hour, five bucks an hour, whatever minimum wage is. Mm-hmm. You're getting paid depending on how many, you know, how many quarts that you pick the strawberries or how many pieces of corn. You know. mm-hmm. At that point, it was on yeah. because now I'm like, okay, wait a second, I can earn more. So I can earn more. I can earn more. Well, you know, I wanted to do that. It's probably why I don't eat fruit today because I freaking got sick of picking it and stuff. <laughs> but you know, you know, it, it's easy to say. But you know, that, that's one thing to draw. My father worked for Pepsi for forty-five years, mm-hmm. forty years. Never missed a day of work. Mm-hmm. Uh, watched him with the gout dra- drag his leg in and stuff. Mm-hmm. And again, as that kid, you know, we actually every Friday. I mean, we literally um, they would they would come together and what bills were going to get paid and what you know had to wait type of thing. And they, do they include you in that? Like they let you hear it? Listen, or? man, we lived in a small house. We didn't have any water. Well, we had of, one bathroom. Keep that away from they, kids, they, they, they try want, to, they but we're, we're, this is an Italian family yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. You know, we talk loud around the kitchen yeah. table. So we were going to hear everything so as you kids. Knew. You're going to, yeah, we knew, okay. you know, the, you know, how'd the, that make you feel? Uh, at the time scared. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. My yeah. pa- me and my sister, we always thought every Friday was divorce court, you know, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. What, you know, who are we going to go live with? We're going to get separated, you know, type of thing because I you think that's heard why the parents fight. don't like to do that cuz they don't want to have that anxiety thrown on their kids. But, right. Right. Yeah. But I, I don't think they thought of it that way no, at no, the no, time, you know. Yeah. I mean, oh, at no. the time it was different. Yeah. You know, it's like yeah. Very you, you did something wrong. You got you got the whip, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Now exactly. you can't even say that and you know, yeah. you're going to child abuse. How did you, know, you feel about having to get up so early and do the corn thing from three it's to all seven? I, it's all I knew. It, so it was no never... big deal because it was something that I was used to. Okay. You know, it's kind of funny so because... The first, time, the first day you weren't like, what? What are we doing? Well, the first day it was fun because it was a trip. Okay. You know what I'm saying? In my mind, it was, yeah, it was, you know, and I, I'm a kid and I get to do something that no kids can do, Yeah. you know, type of thing. And I'm able to earn myself all well, the money. Well, let me stop you right there. Yeah. That in and of itself is why I think guys like you and I exist because you immediately look at it as an adventure as opposed to like, Oh, this is a drag. Right. Got to like, always think positive, like, man. Well, I relate to that uh, because that's the way I look at it. You know, that, I look at life that way. And so I think that's why you and I have known each other for as long as we have and connected right. because we have a very similar kind of outlook on things. You know, if somebody's going to give you something that would be considered garbage, there's always going to be good in it. There's always going to be something you could take away from it or learn from it. Or, and the fact that you immediately didn't look at this situation like, oh, poor me. Why me? You're like, oh, this is super fun. Yeah. You know, and it's work, but you took something from it. Yeah. I, I, growing up for me, even if I was mopping a floor, I never thought I'm above this or this is beneath me. I thought, well, all right, I'm going to do this. And then when I, when I did it and put myself into it, I've kind of learned something about it. I taught my daughter that too. She would come home from college and I would make her do dishes and clean her. And she'd be like, why, why, you know, she'd get so upset. I'm like, I'm trying to make you a good roommate. Mm. When you get like being in a dorm, right? Whatever. Well, when you move out of the dorm and you move into an apartment, you're going to be living with people. That's right. And I don't want you to be a, a, sh- a crappy roommate. I don't want you to leave your dishes in the thing. I don't want you to leave your laundry. In. Get those things out of the way so you're a good roommate. She, I think she resents me to this day. But <laughs> It helped her. But she's a good roommate. Right. Because she's lived with like people who are very slobby, like dirty. And she's like, oh my God, this person's driving me crazy. I'm like, yeah. I told you. There you go. Learned That's a lesson. That's not you. Learned a lesson. So when, totally. you, became a, so when you became a teenager, mm-hmm. it sounds like you were always working. Oh, I always worked, man. I, so what, I always. What was there ever a lag? So you started working when you were really young, doing the corn thing. No, was there ever I'm, a time like like a ten, six, seven, an age where you didn't work at all? No, I mean, obviously, when I was young, I was playing sports. I wasn't working because I was playing ball and doing those things. Yeah. But but no, I always wanted to earn money. I mean, that was something I was always to me. That's my obsession. When was your first my official obsession. job where you were paying like taxes and social security? Uh, I worked in. I was a janitor. I worked in uh, into a convenience store. In How a old? Store. 
I want to, I was to be legal. It was, I think it was 15, Okay. you know, 15, 16, you had to have papers, mm -hmm. you know, working papers and mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's probably was the first legal time, yeah. um, was a stock boy, mm -hmm. worked for Pepsi, obviously worked for my yeah, dad in the yeah, summers, yeah. did all those types of things. And boy, I pissed him off a few times, you know, learned a lot of, a lot of lessons along the way there. But the, the funny thing about it is no matter what I did, what I was cleaning the bathroom, you talked about mopping the floors and doing that thing. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't just put water on the mop and just mop it and say, there, it's done. Mm -hmm. I wanted it to fucking shine yeah. so that it looked perfect. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And it was like, I was just, I, and people say you're OCD. I'm really not OCD. It's work ethic. But it's a work ethic, it's exactly. Pr it's pride in, in your work. Yeah, because it represented me. Yeah. Exactly. And I wanted people to know, hey, he did a good job and I want to pay him more. Exactly. You know, type of thing. And and that's, uh, that is the one thing I can honestly say that I got from, a, from, from my parents from watching them because mm -hmm. there were no excuses, mm -hmm. you know? But guess what? When my father got home from, you know, five o'clock from work, I was sitting outside with a baseball bat and ready to hit, you know, mm -hmm. and he'd go over there and he'd hit me yeah. balls for an hour before we had sat down and had dinner, yeah, you know, yeah, type yeah. of thing. Like he still did his the diligence as a parent, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and kept me grounded and stuff to, mm -hmm. to, to be able to understand that you have different relationships in life and you, and you create these relationships and you know, what are good ones and what are bad ones Yeah, type of thing. But it was funny when you say, you know, what made you any different? I, I didn't know any different. It's just what I knew. Mm -hmm. And I think even today it's like, you know, people are like, how do you do this? How do you, you doing this? you're doing that you know yeah. where do you find a time and it's like you just do yeah you know what i'm saying like yeah. you just do you know that's why i've never been a really great teacher at what i do because i don't think about i just do it yeah and in order for me to teach i would have to have some kind of uh thought process i, I know that it's not that i'm not thinking about what i'm doing but i just get up and i just do that mm -hmm. i don't think about how i did that i just do it right um i will say and i'm I, i'm not the kind of person who likes to slam the generation underneath me mm -hmm. because I remember very acutely what that was like when we were teenagers <laughs> yeah. and how our parents or society kind of looked down on all oh, these crazy kids with their rock and roll or their whatever. I'm like, well, what are you talking about? Like my mom was a big Beatles fan, you mm -hmm. know, I'm like, what are you talking about? You, the Beatles, you know, you like rock and roll too kind of thing. Yeah. But, uh, it's interesting because our generation, Gen X is really like this last generation, like, who seem to be really hands-on. And what I mean by that is this, like I will be talking to somebody and they'll, they'll express, Oh, I, I want to do this thing or whatever. I want, why don't you pick up the phone and do it? Right. Just pick up the phone. And they're like, Oh, well, I don't, you know, maybe I'll text them. I'm like, no, pick up the phone and call whether it's ordering food or anything. They don't want to like, do that anymore. Well, I don't, it's, it's a weird thing. I'm, I'm like, well, they don't want, to communicate they don't want to communicate they don't want a to have a relationship yeah and let me tell you what i'm scared like this is a topic that you know we could speak on here for hours yeah. for because I i'm nervous about that generation i, I saw it with my own kids mm -hmm. you know and stuff especially with you know rocco different than kylie kylie's mm -hmm. older than him mm -hmm. but you know they don't have that communication to, to know i mean let's think about this when you and i were a kid okay mm -hmm. if i picked up a girl mm -hmm. okay or i gave a girl a phone my phone number mm -hmm. Guess what? She would she would go to her house and she would dial the phone like this, zoop, zoop, yep. zoop, 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 yeah. right? So, you yeah. know the rotary oh, dial, yeah. uh -huh. and the phone would ring. And guess who would answer the phone? You or your mom or somebody. No, in your family. my mom or dad would answer the yeah. phone. We weren't allowed to answer the phone. Yeah. Okay, because the phone ain't for us. Because we just live there, right? So my mom and dad would answer. So they'd answer the phone. Hello, who this? Oh, this is this is Carrie. Oh, Carrie who? Oh, uh, Carrie sounds. Oh, and what do you want? Well, I want to talk to Philly. Yeah. Well, what what do you want with my son? Well, I, he gave me his oh, number wow, to that talk happened to in your house. Yes, but they knew what was going on. Sure, they had that 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 connect. You had a connection with your parents, so they knew exactly what was happening. These kids today, I don't know who's calling Rocco, who he's sure. talking to, who he's not. Yeah. I don't know what's going on in his life mm -hmm. unless I sit down and actually have a conversation, and ask him, and pray and hope that I. Tr taught them right to tell mm -hmm. me the truth sure you know sure. what i'm saying sure. but that's the reality they yeah. have full access they, they got their own phone yeah so they bypass dad yeah dad don't know what's going on mm -hmm. oh you didn't know that your son was at so-and-so's party the other night and did xyz mm -hmm. no i didn't know that <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> that type of thing, right <laughs> but more and more like I'm, I'm saying they're they're your hands off you know and they're not dealing with people they're not dealing like you said they're texting they want to text i got a phone so you can call me so mm -hmm. we can have a conversation. Oh yeah. Okay. I get it. if you're in a meeting and I'm trying to trying to get a hold of you, you want to text me, hey, sure, I can't sure, talk. I mean, sure, I, I sure, get that. Sure. Like, there's a place for that too. Sure. Which sure. is super cool. But the reality is, why are you texting me to ask? Like, just pick up the phone and call yeah. me. You know what I mean? It, when you're texting yeah. somebody, to me, you're a coward. It means you really don't want to talk to me. Yeah. 
Well, it's a generational thing too. I think if you and I, if we would have grown up with cell phones and things like that, we might be like that too, because it, it is a different level of, of communication. It's just not the preferred one that I choose because I'm a very A, B, straight to the point kind of a person. And I don't want to spend half the day texting when I can pick or up reading. the phone or reading. And, and just call in three minutes, have it done. Right. It's done. I call you, we, we knock out whatever we're knocking out, boom. But if I'm texting you, you might be driving. I might have to wait an hour for your response. You respond, and I'm confused by your response. I'm eating dinner with my family, and all of a sudden now it's 10 o'clock at night. We haven't solved the issue that I had when I should have called you, yeah. and it's three minutes and we're done. Yeah, we had that too. Remember what it was? It was called writing a letter. We'd write a letter, yeah. put it in the mailbox, and wait for you yeah. to get it, yeah. and then you answer yeah. it, yeah. you know, type of thing. There's a reason why phones were developed, yeah. so you didn't have to write a letter. Exactly. You know what I mean? And now we're writing letters. <laughs> now we're writing letters. <laughs> <laughs> the response can be a little bit faster because you have to put oh, a postage yeah. stamp on sure, it. But sure. that's all it is, man. Thing, yeah. That's a good point. It's a very good point. Well, we could sit here. We could job about all days, all day long. But you know what? I got to, you know, we, we got to wrap it up. And, and I just want you to leave the viewers. Tell some of these younger musicians, okay, what it's like and, and what they can do to help themselves get out there, chase their dreams, and, and not give up. Because you're living proof of somebody who was just an ordinary guy who's doing something super extraordinary, making a living, singing every single day, every single weekend, and actually sustaining it, being smart with your money and everything else. Well, you know, I, I just will retread what I said earlier. Like, if you don't have it in you, if you don't have a burning passion to where, you know, a lot of parents will come up to me and say, hey, we, wanna, we want our son to play guitar. I'm like, what, does he want to play guitar? Well, you know, he's, he's kind of picked up. He's, it looks like he wants to play. We want to get him in classes. I'm like, that's cool. But here's the thing. If your son isn't wrapped around that guitar to the point where, like, you have to take it away from him to put him to bed and say, hey, it's dinner time. No, I got the guitar. If he's not that into it, it, you know, it might not be for him. So I would say to any young performer, whether you're a singer, an actor, if you are a model, if you're somebody who wants to play baseball, wants to be a politician, if you don't live it and breathe it and eat it, it's your world. If that's not how you feel about it, if you're just, if somebody told you at karaoke, hey, you're kind of a good singer, you might want to look into being a professional singer, and you're sort of like leaning in that direction, I'm not saying don't do it, but if it's not your dream, this business will flatten you out. It's hard. I mean, I spent a lot of years barely making any money. No, nothing in my savings account. No wiggle room. There were times when my daughter was very young when we'd come home, I'd pick her up from school or, you know, uh, daycare or whatever it was and came in, the power was out. And I had to make some phone calls, you know. That happened. Mm. I was in my 20s. It happened. Because I was a guy who was doing something that was not a lot of people did. So... But I, I didn't ever think, oh, I should stop this. That was never a thought in my mind. You have to have that attitude because sometimes just sticking around long enough will make will, 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 success will follow. There you go. Well, there you have it, folks. You heard it from Justin himself. Be, be obsessed. No matter what it is that you choose to do in life, whether you want to be a musician, whether you want to go out and you, you want to find another way to get to the moon, be obsessed with it. Put everything into it and know that you can do it. And as Wham Bam always says, remember, if your life was a movie, would it be worth watching? And if the answer is no, then stop being ordinary and start being extraordinary. Till next Wednesday, as always, stay positive, baby. And keep testing negative. I'm your boy Wham Bam, and I'm out. This podcast was brought to you by Cost Plus Processing the leader in merchant processing. Call 1-855-391-9190 and find out why they are the future in merchant.